You're listening to the Doug Stanhope Podcast. School's out for summer. Substitute teacher podcast swap cast. Chaley's gone for two months. Joby is filling in the Chaley spot, but this is a swap cast. This is the Doug Stanhope swap cast and... And uh, phone booth fighting joining in uh, with... uh, Myself, Richard Hunter, and... Frank Mann, I'm here too. Chad Shank and Joby. Yes, nice. it's, it's, it's a yep. swap cast. And uh, uh, thanks for coming down here. We were going to go to Vegas, which oddly is where Chaley and Brian Hennigan are tonight. I'm like, fuck, I want to go to Vegas. And I'm like, fuck, they, they live in Vegas. Yeah. Frank Beer. Wait, I missed a trip to and- Vegas since you guys came down yeah. here? <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> fuck. We just became less likable at the moment, right? Well, <laughs> n- next time. I mean, it's like teams that, you know, play uh, each other uh, multiple yeah, times. Your, your home, home, home turf, our home turf. Yeah, we're in the same division. We have to play each other a couple times a year. Neutral ground in the playoffs. If you don't know, for my listeners, your listeners will never fucking know who we are. But my listeners, Frank Meir and Big Dick Hunter are new comics. So we like to bring out <laughs> new comedians. <laughs> Up and coming. Give them, yeah, give them a chance to show their chops. Well, there's some truth to that. There's yeah. some truth right. to that. Frank Mir is a two-time UFC heavyweight champion. Uh... Now you're you're gonna fight. I can't for the belt pronounce that Champions fucking League. guy's name. Emilienko uh, fucking uh, something. I, I'm bad with the last name too. Yeah, yeah. Fedor. Yeah, everybody just calls him Fedor. Yeah, if you're yeah. Fedor, you, everybody yeah, pretty much about just to fight about. again. What are you? Thirty eight. Thirty nine. Thirty eight. Thirty eight. Still fucking. Yeah. Well, I'm like the third youngest guy in the the, the uh, tournament. So for the heavyweight, not too bad. That's what I love about Bellator because I have. Chad Shank, Joby, Shawnee, who's here, they know MMA inside out. I just pay for it. <laughs> I appreciate that. And then that. we bet. <laughs> yeah. Like, all right, I'll bet on that guy uh, in the weird trunks. Like, I, I, I enjoy it. Yeah, it's a sport. We're a niche sport. You know, we're never going to be mainstream. I know when people sometimes talk about us being like baseball, football, basketball, it's, we're never going to be accepted on that level. It's just like boxing kind of really never became a mainstream. Well, boxing but, is- but it has a fan crowd. Like the crowd we have are very devoted fans and there's a lot of them, but we're never, I don't think we'll ever break into the fact of, you know, Everybody and their mom will go to a football game. You get tickets. All right, let's all go down. Go into a fight is a little bit more of uh, you got to be interested in what's going on. I really yeah. think it is mainstream com- compared to boxing, especially or bo- the fact that boxing exists baffles me because no one since Tyson in his retirement years when he's just a pu- I'm sorry I didn't try my re- hardest. You'd still watch Tyson, but when he left, eh, fuck it. Yeah. Floyd Mayweather. No, yeah. I did lost a lot of interest. I think that's just the promoters themselves who's cut it up too much, and the best fighters never fought each other in uh, in boxing. I think it kind of shot itself in the foot, and that's why you see even Floyd Mayweather, who's the biggest draw in boxing, pulled on Conor McGregor from MMA to sell the most tickets. Which uh, Floyd Mayweather being the biggest ticket sales in boxing is like. A season sorry if he was the only comic left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, you take what you can get. Yeah. 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 It, and, you know, boxing too. I mean, you talk about that lull that it hit post Tyson, Doug. Like that was also the UFC's uh, entree because there was a void. And that's, that's when they really did such a masterful job of branding their product and, and creating, uh, uh, the characters out of their fighters and things like that. So, Let me get right back to that, but yeah. I have to also introduce you. Yes. Big Dick Hunter and I go way back to the Dallas days. We do. We do. You and I, I, I I've never shared this with you before, Doug. I'm going to tell you about the exact moment that I knew you and I would be lifelong friends. So Doug and I, you and I met through uh, the unlikely mutual contact of Joe Francis Whoa. of Girls Gone Wild, right? 
And uh, was it 12 years ago, probably that long ago when you did no, the DVD? Uh, it was uh, 2004, I believe. So okay. like 14 13, years ago. Yeah. So uh, it's 14. So, so Doug is uh, out on the, you know, hosting the DVD and, you know, we're on the tour bus. It's uh, after hours. And uh, uh, I had enjoyed hanging out, talking to Doug. Uh, he's leaning up against the tour bus wall, drinking a beer. You kind of forget for a moment that he's there because right in the middle of the tour bus floor are three 18 year old girls who are totally naked and involved in some sort of triangular lesbian thing going on in the middle of the floor. What they think they're supposed to do yeah. to get yeah. the trucker hat. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's what was up for grabs was the trucker hats. And so they're doing all this in the middle of the floor. They say, kind of forget Doug's over there by the wall until from over my shoulder, I hear Doug say, so what do you ladies think of this whole Patriot Act business? <laughs> I was like, that's my new buddy. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had you around when I was writing the book because I do allude to the Girls Gone Wild chapter where I my sense of humor made not only them not laugh, Girls who were going wild would stop and leave because of my jokes. Yeah, yeah. you were like the cooler. You could, you could, <laughs> when the girls got, when the girls went too wild, you were the guy they needed to bring around to throw cold water on the situation. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Uh, so that's how we met. That's great. Yeah. It, it was a, a terrible thing. I, uh-oh. Oh, shit. I don't know where it is. Okay. Call it. It'll ring. Bingo says she needs my phone for pics. We need pics for Chaley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, for... yeah I'm going to get some. All right, we got it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, but we did a lot of shows together in yeah. Dallas. Yeah. Promoting. Came on my radio show all the time. And, uh, and then you started the podcast, and I moved to Las Vegas, and Frank and I started this podcast together. You so. had some fucking gets on that show. Was it sports talk or was it whoever you wanted? Well, the format was sports talk, but the the irony was I didn't really like sports except for combat sports. So I liked uh, every opportunity to talk uh, martial arts. Uh, but uh, I what I what I did was because I had to play to the format, I gravitated toward the the weirdos, the oddballs of sports. Well, so the- you had the biggest get ever, which somehow, unless I'm uh, and I kind of live under a rock. You got OJ Simpson right after he got acquitted. And I think it was a two parter. Twice. Huh? Yeah. I interviewed Twice. him two different occasions. Jesus. And the, the, the best part was and when you didn't let him fucking slide. No, either. no, he, he, the, the interviews total. Frank's been dying to hear these. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the interviews total probably about four hours, uh, uh, overall. And he answered every question that I had about, you know, of course, there's no tearful, I did it confession or anything like that. The one like question that. you asked, every time you brought this up, you bring up that one. Oh, the hypothetical? The hypothetical. So he I gave me the chills. I'm like, oh, man. I said to him, I said, okay, OJ, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Uh, right now, cause at that point it had, it, you know, he had been basically walking the streets, uh, with the, the, everyone assuming he's a double murderer and him insisting he didn't do it. So I said, okay, here's the hypothetical, OJ. You tell me you didn't do this. All right. So that means you are leading this singular existence of every day, everybody looks you in the face, believes you did something you didn't do. Here's the hypothetical. I can wave a magic wand right now, and uh, I can make all that go away. So you're going to wake up tomorrow. No one's going to think you did this. Here's the trade-off. Right now, there is some poor, black, uh, destitute, innocent uh, man wrongfully accused of a double murder. He's going to go to prison for life. Okay, So he's going to pay for that. Pick. You can either exonerate him or and continue to bear the burden or, you know, you'll, you'll be, it'll be different tomorrow. So the politically correct thing is to say, Oh, I would never want anybody to go through what I've gone through. You know, I'll bear the burden for him. Right. Without hesitation, he looks at me and he goes, you know, that is terrible if that were to happen to him. But let me tell you, I didn't do this. Uh, uh, you know, for, for myself, for my family, for my kids, I would have to exonerate myself. And I thought to myself, okay. That right there is the honest answer of either a wrongfully convicted man 
or a sociopath. And we're right back to where we started. <laughs> right, yes. I say it's a sociopath. Yeah. We tried you didn't to say get... you convict the bad guy. You said just <gasps> exonerate yeah. himself, clear his own name. Yeah. To let another guy rot in jail, you're a fucked up human being. We tried to get him on the man show when our, our failed season of that, where we were going to have OJ just close every episode like an Andy Rooney 60 Minutes where he's just sitting at a cluttered desk <laughs> complaining about ATM fees or something. <laughs> we never mention the murder. We just say, and now Heisman Trophy winner, O.J. Simpson. Did you ever notice? He just does some goofy thing, which you know he would do. Yes. But the producers, oh, no, I I knew Nicole Brown yeah. Simpson. That, that, I would still love to have that him That would have been on. a great idea, the biggest elephant in the room I've ever seen. Right? That was a genius idea. Now, now you well, could possibly... He's back in Vegas, uh, and that's where you guys are from. Yeah. No, I was going to say, now the possibility exists. You may not have been able to do it on that last season of The Man Show. You might be able to do it on this podcast now. <laughs> you know, he is available. The fact that you guys, <laughs> and for uh, the uh, phone booth fighting listeners, yes. who are we? We're just uh, you know, three drunk half comics that live down on the border in Bisbee, and you guys came down here, which I love. Let me, let me, because I, I sing your praises uh, on our podcast, the the Doug Stanhope podcast, Doug Stanhope and Friends, because it's so interesting. This is my first time to actually be here in Bisbee with you, and the cast of characters, because it's an ensemble cast. Doug. I mean, your name is on the marquee, but uh, I mean, the group behind us, and then some. Yeah, we don't get Charo like you could get in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, to, to be a long time listener to the podcast, now I'm able to put all these faces with the voices that I've been hearing for a long time. Chad Shank looks like he sounds, doesn't he? He does. He really does. Yeah, I absolutely. Hear that, uh, exactly you actually like do a yeah, an impression? We, yeah, we heard you do a, an impression. Let's, let's yeah, get this. I, 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 and I understand I'm not an impressionist by trade, but along the way, I've picked up three voices that I can do chronologically conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. Country singer Trace Adkins, and now I believe the most marketable of them all. Let me build this up just a bit. Yeah. Both you and Frank Mir have gone uh, uh, sidetracked from your fighting career and your radio career into both doing stand up comedy. True. So, yeah. obviously, you probably don't do Chad Shank on stage. <laughs> <laughs> No. Anyone? Doug Stanhope podcast? The other guy? The guy that people like? Chad Chang? Anyone? It's perfect. Yeah. I can yeah. do a, a perfect impression of my landlord in Massachusetts right. in 1989, Mr. Minas. But it doesn't translate. It, but go, yeah, no, it's, it's in development. Like, if there's a police blotter or something like that, I might be able to... Uh, Who's, uh, who's the best? Who's team. your best? Alex Jones? Probably Alex. I don't just know because, Trace Atkins yeah, for shit. Uh, with, uh, um, it, with Trace Atkins, if you've just seen the Wounded Warrior Project commercials where he's raising money, and what he does is he just talks in a real low, dulcet tone and kind of whistles through his bottom teeth right about here. <laughs> Doug, uh, I know the commercials, yeah. but I'm crying so hard I don't listen to yeah. the voice. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's, you know, Alex is probably the best because just he applies to anything, you know, whatever you're disagreeing with me about, you know, Doug Stanhope, we've got the documents. Infowars.com, Doug. You know, I, I, you know, I, you're a smart guy and I love your comedy, but obviously if you haven't looked into the documents with, uh, with, uh, Project Hummingbird, then you would know we've got all the documents at Infowars.com. I'm telling you, Doug, this is something. Now, this is something not a lot of people are covering. But uh, but my 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 Chad and I, I got Chad Chad, just please uh, say something like I'm I'm really looking forward to your impression of me, so they can balance <laughs> that, it immediately. That was a fantastic Alex Jones impression. Yeah, yeah, I really that liked a, that. For that was, sure. a, that was, that was fantastic, Alex Jones. That was that was great. You know what 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 I quickly realized about Chad was after listening to the audio book. There was sober buttoned up uh, Chad Shank, and then there was podcast Chad Shank. Because yeah. the version I do is not that audio book guy. That guy was on his best behavior. I'm with the, I'm with the, I'm with the professional with the, Chad. Yeah, I'm with this, I'm with this guy about you know, three hours of the podcast. Yeah, you know, this guy is Chad Shank. He has, you know, serious, I don't, his blue apron. <laughs> As I said, not an impressionist the, by trade. The, 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 the f uh, funny thing is, Margot does a better Chad Shank 
the lady who sold me this house yeah. sounds exactly like him accidentally. Oh, yes, yes. Hi, uh, this is Margo Wallenberg. I was just calling to see if you're having that Super Bowl party again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if I was to do a Margo impression, I'd have to go way deeper. <laughs> Hopefully you meet her tomorrow. And you guys are in town for a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, Frank Mir, yeah, how I long have you been doing comedy? Uh, well, actually, it was about a uh, has it been a year? About a year. Yeah, about a year ago, because you know Richard told me he's done stand up, and we were sitting there bullshitting one time, and I was like, you know what? I love comedy. I watch a lot of comedy, and I've always had a lot of respect for guys and go up on stage because to me, it's it's one hell of an expression of yourself. Because I mean, you know, you you paint a painting and someone doesn't like it, you're not necessarily around when they're booing at it. You know what I mean? You go up there and you say something everybody finds stupid, or if it just falls flat on its face. You're standing up there all by yourself, you know, and I, and I have a lot of respect for that because of what I background I come from. You know, I have a good day at work and I'm everybody's hero. I have a bad day at work and there's an ESPN highlight of me getting my head knocked off. You know <laughs> I mean? like, and I got to walk past every bar on the way up to my hotel room watching the highlights, you know. So uh, at that moment, he's like, hey, would you ever do it? I'm all, well, shit. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. I'm, I'll jump up there. Let's go. You know, give me a few pointers and uh so what happens? So we, we got his first date booked, right? And so he's going to open my show at the Stratosphere. And so I come over to his house and I told him weeks prior, I said, just, you know, sketch down some ideas you have and all <laughs> that. We'll go over. So I go sit down in the living room, comes out with his legal pads. And I don't want to get in this. Uh, oof, <laughs> that's a big high five. Break out a fucking. I write only in legal pads. These kids with they fucking put it on their phones. I have a yellow legal pad, yeah. and that's the only way I write. And after 27 years, I have stacks. Of them. Well, I'm so does Frank. Do. He has stacks of them because he, he came out, and I sit down in the living room, you know, audience of one. And uh, and I wouldn't get in his head or anything, so I just said, just, you know, spit it all out. Let me hear what you got, and then, you know, we'll punch up here or there. And uh, he, he did about an hour and ten minutes for me. And uh, he said, do you think that's enough? And I said, well, what we're going to do is there's some good ideas there. We're going to take about 95 percent of that and concentrate it down to a good tight, you know, seven, seven. minutes. Yeah. yeah. And Frank said, are you uh, sure you yeah, think that's going to be like enough? Speaking Chinese. Like, are you serious, man? He goes, yeah, you know, you have like about 90 different ideas. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, we're going to use about five. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, but. But they I'm were. Like, how long is it going to last? Like 30 seconds? He's like, no, it's about 10 minutes. I'm like, yeah, shut up. There's no way. But they were they were good ideas, and he got up, and you were so committed. The interesting thing is, he was competitive about it the way that he's competitive about fighting. So he didn't want to use any notes. Like he worked it enough to where he didn't need any notes, anything like that. He had all his beats down and everything. And there was a unanimous decision among the uh, you know the contrarian comedians back table where everybody sits with their arms crossed yep. uh, in judgment. That of anybody I we had my arms crossed the most at that table. Yes, yes, <laughs> not yours <laughs> in spirit. In, in theory. Yes, but but of we we all agreed that of anybody we had ever seen try comedy that wasn't a comedian, you know, because it happens from time to time. The the actor, or the musician, oh. or the athlete, oh. whatever. Yeah, that Go Frank ahead. was Frank was the best that that we'd seen. It was a great effort, and he liked doing it so much he wanted to keep doing it. So now you got about four appearances under your belt, right? Yeah, yeah. First time fighting, say, professionally, right, right. what was more scary to you, comedy oh, or comedy. fighting? Oh, definitely. When I was back <laughs> behind the curtains, it was funny because earlier my wife afterwards, she's all, hey, that guy there was funny. He went on just before you. She named out four or five comedians. I'm like, I have no oh, fucking clue. That's a dick move. Well, no, <laughs> no, not that way. But she was just saying like, oh, hey, the, earlier we heard him. I'm like, honestly, babe. But you were sitting in the audience. I was like, she didn't say follow that motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I was off in my own world, you know, right, just constantly. Right. I mean, at that point, a bomb could have went off in the room and I probably wouldn't have noticed. Right. I was so like, okay, you know, let's, let's well, focus. And now he's graduating to the next level because the first couple of gigs, it was, you know, in in front of of my crowd, our podcast crowd. I mean, they yeah, were Frank Mir fans. Territory. I mean, I even introduced yeah. him, you know, by saying, listen, you don't have to laugh, but you're going to see him on the way out. So <laughs> keep it in mind. But <laughs> nice. but now what he's done is his last appearance, he went up cold in front of just a random Sunday night. I've lost all my money in Vegas crowd of and they weren't 30, laughing at anybody. No idea. No idea. I won't do that anymore. <laughs> I won't. I go to yeah. L.A. Yeah. Hey, you want to do a set at Sunday night at the comedy store? No. I only play to my own crowd. I earned that. And 
they will fucking hate me. Yeah. No, it was bad. There was a guy up there that actually has a funny bit. You know, he's funny as shit. He has this thing where, you know, he turns into an old black man. He takes off his hat and he's funny as shit. And about five minutes into it, he starts. Already sounds terrible, but go ahead. <laughs> he starts addressing the crowd. They're like, you know, are you guys not here to have a good time? You know, and I'm like watching. I'm even taking notes. Like when I watch other people, just like fighting. Like, okay, I want to emulate that. And I was looking at. It, I was like, the fact that he's pointing out that the room is not laughing, but him pointing it out made it even worse. So I'm like, all right. So note to self: no matter how bomb I <laughs> bad I bomb up there. Don't take notice of it. It's almost like if you land a good shot, I'm not going to tell you you landed a good shot. It's like, fuck it. You land, you know it. I don't have to acknowledge it. We're just going to keep on moving. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. I'm not going to give you the credit or the, the, that type of, nah, nah, I'm just going to, so I just kind of focus. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to focus on different eyes and just no matter what, because there's a couple of times I said stuff. I'm like, that's funny, man. Why aren't you laughing? I'm like, no, no, don't get caught up in that. Yeah. We, we talked about this last night. Bingo had a, a Q and A for her new book and we talked about, you never acknowledge that you're sucking on stage because the crowd might not know it. So <laughs> yeah. if you go, oh, you guys suck. Like, oh, I thought he was doing fine. Yeah. He had confidence until he just broke it. And now we think he sucks because he told us he sucks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But as far as uh, uh, Chad Shank and I today listened to was a 10-minute clip of uh, what's his name? Bisping. Bisping. Has a podcast, yeah. and he was. T- I, I I have to assume it's Louis Gomez he's talking to because it's not listed in the credits. But he, they're talking about you and uh, Brendan Bar- Shaw. Shab. Oh, okay. Brendan's do, good. Do, doing comedy now, and where Louis? I assume it's Louis Gomez. If it's not you, I'm sorry. At one point, he refers to you as Louis, and there's no fucking name listed. But like how like. Guys like you, like he's been working forever and you usurp him immediately because you're already famous. But Bisping was really respectful about both of you. A, because you know what? You can only fight for so long and then what are you going to go into? Yeah, yeah. True. Yeah. Fucking selling shoes. What? Yeah. And, but then also, too, the only guys, I mean, that might get you in the door, but the only thing that's going to keep you uh, getting invited back is if you're working at it. You Charlie know? Sheen. But I didn't want to have that, that issue. Yeah. This, yeah. Is, this is where I'm going. Charlie yeah. Sheen issue. Is comedy becomes this garbage dump. And uh, again, I'm doing it 28 years or something uh, where all of these people who have 15 minutes of fame. Cato Kalin went into stand-up comedy. And you're like, are you fucking kidding me? Yep. Again, they were respectful of you guys. You're actually funny. And comics even thought you were funny, just like Dick Hunter saying. But other people that they're just like weird... Like you know, Alien other, Gonzalez could you know have gone the, into you, comedy. You, you know the other trap. You know the other trap about that too, Doug, is that even if they want to start getting into comedy, okay, it's one thing if they're doing a five minute guest spot or seven minutes, you know, somewhere at the top of the bill. What's happening too, though, is a lot of club promoters will go, "Oh my gosh, we can fill a room with this name, headliner," I think you know, and mistake. all of a sudden they're up there trying to do forty minutes when really they have a good five. Well, that's why that. I, I think that Brendan does a good job. And I know why I think that I want, aspire to do a good job is because I haven't been paid for doing comedy. You know, I mean, if one day ever I can make money out of the like, bonus, you know well, what I mean? But it's kind of the same reason I got into fighting. I like to fight somebody. I enjoy fighting. The fact I get paid to do it just means that now my wife leaves me alone when I go to the gym. It's like, well, honey, you know, you like that purse. Uh, I get to we, go to the we, gym. We, we were joking about uh, uh, you and Chad because Chad is a different kind of fighter where he... He he tries not to, <laughs> but uh, I uh, we were joking about you guys sparring together since you're going into training yeah, yeah, yeah. soon, jokingly. But I thought, what would what would you rather do, spar each other or do an open mic off on stage? Because <laughs> mm. Chad is also 
Uh, he wants to do. Well, obviously, I feel more stage. confident in a fight. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I think Chad would probably pick comedy in this instance. No, I would rather get beat, knocked unconscious immediately <laughs> than fucking <laughs> look like an asshole for a lot longer than I would take uh, me to get knocked out. I don't know, man. Don't he worry, is. that's not going to happen on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He is no. So awful what I'll say that uh, Brendan does it, I think, because he really enjoys it, and that's why I do it. And I think if you get into comedy. For that reason, that's why I think all comics start off. I mean, I think if you start off trying to make money at anything, it, it, I see it in fighting. Back when I started fighting, you weren't going to make money at it. In fact, when you start dating a girl, I never told – that's the quickest way for me to get a girl to walk out on me. Hey, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm half naked. I get locked into a cage and I beat people up. You know what I mean? Like, well, do you make money at that? I'm like, no, I have a day job. It's barely – I just do it for fun. You know I mean? well, uh, then you don't mention the day job. Yeah, they, you know? They'll fuck you if you just start with the cage and Not the even then, people. man. No, people, not back then. No, not yeah. back then, you know? Uh, now everybody in their, they shaves their head and tattoos and wears a tap out t-shirt. They think they can fight. And so we get guys that come in the gym and they do it just, just to try to have that, you know, moniker that, oh, I'm a badass. I'm a fighter. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, we're going to spar. We're going to wrestle. And that first day of actually having pressure put on them, it's like, oh, if you're here for money, you're not going to be thinking about money when the shit gets hard. But if you're here because you like it, I'm going to kick your ass and you're going to be, and then you're going to sit there and go, Oh, fuck. I want to be able to do that. You know, I, I, I want to get better. I want to improve. And then it, it's the right path. You know? I open my book with that about people who email me now and say, Hey, uh, I have, uh, I've written two hours of material just like you did. You had an hour and 10 yeah, that you yeah. did in his living room, but how do I get an agent? And like, you're missing the point. Like, yeah. I did comedy just to see if I could do it the same way people do karaoke. That's the reason why I started uh, fighting. No, to totally. See. That's why I think that there's so many similarities. Being an individual, being up there by yourself, representing yourself, success, failure, pressure, all the things. I think all the emotions that a, a comic goes through, a fighter's going through the same thing backstage, wrapping his hands, getting ready to walk out. So if you fight for any other reason besides to test yourself or to find out, you know, you know, there's like an insecurity to it. Like I was telling to one of my uh, high school friends that coaches my football team. I even made a joke. I was like, well, you know, one thing that I've had to get over later in life is that if I'm injured, not to go train. And it's the worst thing to tell a fighter that if you're not a hundred percent, don't go in the gym because I don't think I, I, I'm worried in the back of my mind, still now 38 years of age. If I cancel sparring because something's messed up on me, I'm like, ah, oh, I bet you they think I'm a pussy. Yeah. I, that's why I didn't show up. You know what I mean? I didn't step up there. I didn't go in front of the he lights. He canceled the tour due to exhaustion. <laughs> He's a drug addict. <laughs> right. So it's Stop hard. Something's wrong with yeah, him. Because inherently all fighters, or I think anybody, were extremely insecure. You don't sit up there. A, a secure guy that doesn't need anything to prove in life probably doesn't think that I want to go f test myself as a fighter. If and somebody wonders, well, I wonder if I could do that, it scares the shit out of me. And no one else thinks I can do it either. So you know what? I have to do it. But uh, that was one of the things that Bisping was talking about in that interview was every time he's backstage, he's A, insecure and going, there's always a beat in his head going, why the fuck am I doing this? This is... 100%. I am gonna... When I'm getting my hands wrapped, that's why I'm like... I, my wife, we make that joke. It'll be the day before the the day of the fight, the morning of. I'll look at her. And I've said it for the last 16 years now, professionally fighting. I'm like, why the fuck do you let me do this? Three months ago when I agreed to this, why don't you tell me this is what I'm going to feel like today? You know I don't want to do this. Why am I doing this? But then there's just one foot in front of the other. Just something drives you where you can't keep from doing it. How did you meet Big Dick Hunter? Actually through uh, mutual friends and because he's one of the top journalists in our sport. And so uh, he had interviewed me a couple times, and then we hung out, and then just some no, of the I, okay, I lost track with you at some yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because, you know, uh, I started on that sports format station, I did genuinely love MMA. So I was always covering it. So I kept enhancing my profile into that until basically a large part of my radio uh, uh, career was based on MMA. So I'm at all the UFC fights. I'm doing the press conferences, stuff like that. We interviewed a couple of times and we actually had a, another fighter friend, uh, Dan Hardy. Uh, it, it was always telling me 
if do you have you ever hung out with Frank Muir? If you guys ever hung out, you would really get along. You have a lot in common, all this kind of stuff. And that always stuck in my head. And eventually we did. And actually our podcast, I mean, the the first great podcast didn't even make the air because they were just long conversations. Yeah. And it was Frank's idea. He's like, we got to start recording these and just put them out as podcasts. So that's yeah, how we do it born. all the time. There's times like something will happen because, you know, Richard's a lot more savvy when it comes to politics than I am. You know, I mean, whenever, like, look, that's one thing, you know, being a good general is you understand when people have things that are better than you. It's it's not a thing of insecurity. It's a thing of like, okay, well, I'm going to lean on that. Take advantage of it. You know what I mean? Shit, you know more about this than I do? Well, fuck, we're a team now. You tell me about it. So I'd call him up and ask him questions about current events. Like, hey, so, so what does this mean exactly? And, you know, and then he could point me in the right direction. Like, well, if you want to look something up, go this way, go that way. Here's a contrary thought on it. And somebody that was stayed almost kind of like unopinionated at the same time. Where it wasn't like he was trying to ever try to cram any of his beliefs down my throat. You know, you talk to somebody and they, they have that agenda. Where Richard just purely loved knowledge. And that's how I've always been. I'm like, oh man, I just love knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And then after a while, I was like, you know what, dude, if we actually take these conversations, even though you don't drink, this is kind of like a bar conversation where, you know, two buddies sitting down having a beer going, you know, so what's happened today? And then the next two or three Funny. hours were just bullshit. All right, no, uh, no, no, I'm listening, but uh, we we have to break it twenty so we can both do our own commercials for each other's podcasts. Yes. So yeah, boy, what a champagne problem to have. You know, this is the part where we have to pause our swap cast so we don't can worry. We're just going to hit pause. Then we yes, we'll tape that shit later. Yeah. And then we're going to go right back to this conversation. When, when you do it, since this is uh, since we're in here, can I be the one to say hold, please? Please hold. <laughs> yeah. Big Dick Hunter, you listened to our Audible a book, Digging Up Mother. I sure did. I did the uh, free trial. Your book was the first one that I downloaded, and uh, I am hooked. Audible has a new customer, thanks to your audiobook. I always say, the years on the road when I lived out of my car for three years... All right, I'm, I stink at this. You take over. <laughs> I, I have probably close to 200 books in my Audible library. Yeah. I have a subscription that I pay like 14 something a month for, but then I can download like 39 hour long books that would cost $60 with that $14 credit. And then if it turns out that the narrator really sucks, but usually you listen to a sample, so you know if it sucks or not. Mm -hmm. But if for some reason you don't like the... Very uh, important. (laughs) Yeah. If for some reason, if you don't like it, you can uh, uh, return it and get your credit back. And uh, it's a, it's a fucking good deal. I don't know. It's, if you like listening to audiobooks, it's a, it's a good deal. Uh, I, 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 I fell for some clickbait today. On Newser, hey Newser, stop making it more clickbait than it should be. But it was the 10 worst cities for traffic. <coughs> and LA was first, and they spend an average of 102 hours in traffic every year. You know what makes that better? Just sitting there listening to Audible. Just listening to audible books. You're listening to a book. You've been with us where we did this, where we just sat in front of the hotel because there's only 35 more minutes and we waited in front of the hotel to listen to the rest of the book. There's so many good books. Rabbit is one I remember. Miss Pat. Yep, that was a good one. A lot of times I've noticed, too, you don't realize a book has come out that's going to pique your interest. And Audible learns your likes because based on the fact that I downloaded Doug's book, it thinks I might like this book or that book. And I'm turned on to something I didn't even know existed. Oh, nice. Here's the, okay. o- here's the other th- here's the other thing, too, is they have a thing called channels, Audible channels mm. that they're setting up. And they're almost like podcasts. And some of them are even excerpts from podcasts, but they might have like a true crime thing mm-hmm. and they'll give you. So I've got turned on to some, some new podcasts from the audible channels and then some new audio books as well from those channels. And, uh, they got the one, that's the one where they have the uh, butterfly effect from, uh, Ron oh, Johnson. Yes. Nice. It's the, uh, Ron uh, Johnson. Yeah. About, about so, the, uh, porn. John por- Ronson. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever we said. The, the, uh, it's about the pornography industry and it's in, Fucking incredibly interesting. It has kept us alive on the road. 
when we're driving from Bloomington, Indiana to Bloomington, Illinois, and we don't know which way we're going, but we can't wait to get back into the car to listen to Audible books. It's so fucking hard to read a book anymore because you have all these gadgets and bit. Hey, you get a text message and there's a Twitter and you're sitting in a car, which we do because we have to, and you do because you have to, because you got to get to work, and you live in San Francisco and you think <laughs> it's so fucking cool to live in San Francisco, but you sit in goddamn traffic. <laughs> if, so where are you going to click if, when you go if you're, to there? If you're, if you're not already a member of Audible, go to audible.com slash Stanhope. All right. <laughs> nice. Good. Good. Or text... Benny Hill just chimed in. <laughs> that was fucking pretty funny. <laughs> or text Stanhope to 500-500. That's a new one. I didn't know yep. you could do that. Mm-hmm. So te- so you just got a text. That sounds like a phishing scam. It's not. It's, it's a not. fucking it's real. sponsor. It's God swear to Buddha. Shady. Is that real? Cut that out. Yeah. Don't no, say that. Don't cut that don't out. say that. That's a, that's I, a real thing. It's a real fishing scam. It sounds like I'm going to go to bed. Do, do one of your call center calls and convince me to text Stanhope to 500. Hey, Big Dick Hunter. Hello? Yeah? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Hey, it's great to hear from you. Hi, I'm sorry. Listen, who's this? I heard you used to be someone back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 your I mean, wife I laughed so hard at so. that. so. That's... <laughs> It's a vague compliment. I'm sorry, who was this? <laughs> I used to be someone too. Yeah. Uh yeah, the call came up unknown, so I didn't <laughs> We both have to drive a long way to work. Uh, th- that is true, but how do you know my route? Remember when we thought we'd have a private jet? We don't. We have to listen to Audible books. <laughs> Audible. Well, now you're speaking my language. I do enjoy Audible, Mystery Caller. I'm not sure who this is or what you want, but you're right on one thing. We do both apparently love Audible. Audible. <laughs> Hit the bullet points. Let's get the fuck out of here. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audible.com slash scanhope and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audible.com slash scanhope or text scanhope to 500-500 to get started today. Audible.com. All right, we're back. I was going to go back into what you were saying, but I forget. Oh, just me and Richard starting the show. And then... Then it was basically the first premise of it. Richard came up with the idea of the phone booth fighting. And I liked it because it's, it's definitely, uh, uh, an analogy that everybody uses in the fight world. Oh, well, explain fight- that to me because I don't. Well, know. basically fighting in a phone booth would be first got used in boxing, meaning that two guys basically, especially if you fought like a Muhammad Ali type, a guy that was slick on his feet, moved around. Well, they would always say, Oh, you got to fight him like you're in a phone booth, meaning that you got to corner him off, stick him in the corner of the boxing ring and fight him in close. The essentially like me fighting you in a phone booth where you have nowhere to go. Yeah. So now no fancy dancing. You can't slip out of the way. We're going to go blow for blow. And I thought that was cool because I thought that the idea of it kind of fit the mentality of how Richard and I are. It's like, well, I'm just going to ask you the question instead of, you know, let's just bring it up. I hate when, you know, you know. And, oh, wait, I, this is in my notes. Yeah. Nowadays time, there's so many things that you have to kind of avoid and skim around, especially how politically correct the culture, you know, has let become. me, let, let me, go, because. Yeah. Again, the the first thing you do is go to the Wikipedia page, but you have a quote on your Wikipedia page where you uh, you say exactly this. I'm not going to be politically correct. I'll just tell you what I want to say. If I I'm not going to be the guy that says I respect him as a fighter, and he, why is that coming out of my mouth if I don't believe it? I want to fight Brock Lesnar. I want to break his neck. I want him to be the first person to die in the ring due to <laughs> octagon rules. Yeah, I said That's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, lost my uh, commentating job at the time with WC. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I got pulled out of, uh, uh, I think at the point in time they were selling my merchandise in Walmart from UFC, and I got the phone call that, 
that's <laughs> they that's yanked more it. embarrassing. Yeah, they yanked my merchandise. And then uh and then my response again after that was, Well, fuck you guys if you're too stupid to figure out that you know that I'm talking about intensity, this and that. And then that didn't go over well either. So finally it was like <laughs> my wife's like, Yeah, less is more, you know. <laughs> okay, instead of saying something you don't believe in, just don't say anything at all. So that's what I kind of do now. That's my new montage. Oh, my like, I hope I, ho- I hope your wife talks to Jenny, Chad's wife. Yeah, right. No, no. They'll be like baseball wives. Yeah, less is more. <laughs> less Both is more. <laughs> Chad, Chad doesn't fight the rig. He does it in traffic. <laughs> Don't leave at the window. <laughs> yeah. He follows you home. So anyway. the, the whole phone booth thing that that actually became something that we kind of fell on, and even though we start off always, you know, obviously it's a martial arts fight based podcast. We talk fights, but we quickly drift off on different ideas, and and just... it really is a fantastic podcast. Thanks, I man. listen to Thank you know, you. A, a ton of them, and yeah, it really is. It's what, you know, I encourage anyone to listen to it. It's great. What I, what I love about it that I always tell people is it's like it's 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 the actual um, natural evolution and documentation of our friendship because. Because it really kind of started at the beginning, and then a couple years later, it's to the point it is now. So it's like if you could actually follow somebody through that. And like Frank said, I mean, you know, a lot of people will come for the fighting, but we do talk about a lot of politics, music sometimes. And that's part of the fun is just seeing, surprises me sometimes, like which direction it will go. The greatest thing that's happened to me through this podcast so far is uh, I was I was looking at Frank's Twitter and I noticed that uh, my my childhood hero, Paul Stanley of Kiss, followed Fra- not only followed Frank, but is a huge Frank fan, like post these good luck messages to him before his fights and everything. <laughs> so I'm explaining to Frank, because Frank's <laughs> 10 years younger than me, listen, this, this guy had more influence on me than my own father. You know, DM him. Let's see if we... I was hoping for a phone or one thing leads to another, and he invites us to his house to set up just like this and do a podcast in his living room. It was like the coolest thing ever. And it was just a very uh, accidental thing that happened because of the, the podcast. I never get tired of when I get starstruck where that, that person follows me on yeah. Twitter for, for, for why, what, what? Yeah. No, and same. Frank, when Frank, when I found out, let's get to death pool since this segues. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. yeah. Because I understood, we started, Joby started Death Pool. It's Doug Stanhope's celebrity Death Pool because I have a, more of a face than Joe Whitlock. But it's it was his thing. Mm-hmm. So then he made it into a thing with Doug Stanhope. And then I saw Big Dick Hunter. I haven't seen him in, and then Frank Mears in our fucking league. <laughs> It was leading our league he last was. year. We were yeah, fucking killing early on. I came out on. hard. <laughs> I, I, no I, pun. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I've been playing since day one. So what are we, fourth, third, third year, fourth year at this, this point? This is the sixth season. So you might have since the website was yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I got on when the website started. Yeah. So, but, but I told Frank that I played in it, and he was instantly like. That's the greatest thing I've ever heard of. Like, how do I get involved? And no, no, so, no, no, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, no. Did you actually have either of you looked at Frank Muir's profile on the Death Pool site? His bio, read his bio. I didn't all. know there was one. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's in our, our database. No, I know he's oh, in the oh, database. Oh, the database. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I was actually, yes. when yeah. I first found out about yeah. it, that was actually my first question. I was like, hey, wait a minute. Am I in the death pool? Am I yeah. qualified yeah. to be a and celebrity? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which you it, are not. Dick Hunter right. does I've, not have a rejected. Wikipedia page. Yeah, yeah and, quick, quick. No, and a couple of our fans actually picked me. And I, and I yeah, think yeah. Cool. And, and your, yeah. your bio is a tow bar aficionado. Oh. And that's what I put in on your bio. It's like, <laughs> nice. Well, well, let's just tell this story quickly because right. that's why when he told me the tow bar thing, <laughs> two people, Tank Abbott and someone else, yeah. you yep. tow barred out. Our, uh, my, uh, manager, Brian Hennigan, the filthy uncut Scotsman, we watched UFC one night. And, you know, like when you were a kid and you watch Rocky and you want to punch someone in the face <laughs> after the movie in the street. Well, we were geared up and we tried to attack Hennigan, who's got powerful legs. And we tried. Uh, we jumped. We jumped quickly. on him. He's not a fighter, no. <laughs> but he had to be that night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was two on one, but me and Joby jumped him and without having any, uh, let's fucking tap him out. And we both went for toe bars without. At the same time, not knowing what we were going to do. He tapped out. 
Yeah, and we got him to tap out, but the next morning we woke up and we had bruises all over our body and we couldn't figure out how sore we were. And like, what what happened? He had fucking Willie the groundskeeper fucking tree trunk thighs <laughs> and he kicked trying the to shit beat us, us off. Just, but oh but we t- we tow barred him out. So yeah. we both have a tow bar under our belt. Right. So go. we're kind of the same guy. I see it, I see it. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Yeah. But when I started Frank Frank saw what I was doing in Death Pool. He wanted to get in, so so we got him involved in, in just like fighting, just like stand up comedy, uber competitive. I mean, it instantly turned into this. Well, where am I rank? Well, I, who's who, you know? I got to make a trade. I got to I got to move on. In fact, I brought this for uh, for show and tell. Uh, uh-huh. This is a poster advertising one of uh, Frank's seminars, a jujitsu seminar that yeah. he did in England. Just read that, uh, if you will, Chad. This or whoever, Joby, yeah, yeah, that no, first, no, 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 that yeah, first yeah, paragraph, just read. These are the, this is the way Frank promotes himself on this poster now. Go ahead. Decorated jujitsu black belt under Ricardo Perez. Record for most fights, victories, and submissions in U.S. heavyweight, in UFC heavyweight history. Fourth most UFC victories overall. The only person to win a UFC bout by toehold. <laughs> the longest interrupted tenure of any fighter in UFC history. The first man to knock out and submit Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira. The fastest Separate kill. Fights. The oh. fastest kill in celebrity death pool history. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you get first blood. <laughs> right. You get first blood. Right, r- r- right here <laughs> on the poster. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember and, who was your first blood kill that oh, year? Uh, William Hurt. That's right. Yeah, yeah. He killed William him Hurt, within yeah. 38 minutes of the season launching the guy who was uh. dead. It was incredible. And four people have you picked site wide. I'm just looking it up right now. <laughs> I, I, Don't mention my name. Uh, how many no, people? no, there is this. Not there is, and but they're all four of them are in phone booth fighting. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 But they're all four yeah. different people. Yeah, we yeah. have a we have a show league, and there's like a hundred and so, some people. So what's your that. league? Phone there, booth fighting. You, you, Joby, take yeah. over this because yeah. I am. Yeah, their their anymore. funeral home is phone booth fighting. They've been doing it for you know for quite on qu- on Doug, Doug Stanhope celebrity DSCDP dot com. And uh, they've been doing it for quite some time. And now they have, yeah, you're up to 100 people in yeah. your funeral home. So, yeah. uh, And then Frank and I yeah. play in, in the uh, the select league, if yeah, you will. Yeah, it's our flagship league, which yeah. is just like 10 of us, you know, just tight so, circles. So who's in first in that one right that now? That would be yeah. Chad Shank. Oh, and yeah. and Shannon, a friend of mine, Shannon, uh, she plays second in your oh, nice. fighting last year. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, yeah you, you, Doug, tore it up. You, you you mentioned like so the celebrities wanting to know if they're in and all that because I have a weird story about that. The first year that I was uh, doing Death Pool, I had this other weird side gig where I do public relations for Dennis Hoff, the guy that owns the Bunny Ranch. I, so uh, I know we're getting to that. He's yeah, in my yeah, notes. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sitting well, in I his guess house. That's where we segue next. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you know, uh, Dennis Doug. He's a, he's not exactly a wallflower when it comes to the he media is, spotlight. Uh, second only to Ron Jeremy of the biggest self promoters yes. ever. Yes. So and they hang out. So yeah, exactly enough. So I'm I just happen to be as I'm filling out my roster. I happen to be sitting in his house, and I was telling him what I was doing, and I said, you know, Dennis, because I'm looking for inside information, and I had always had Ron until Ron had his heart attack. I had him and he flew under the radar. I used to always have him as a solo pick because he, he's the unhealthiest person I personally know. And so I was like, something's going to happen sooner or later. And sure enough, but then once he had his heart attack, it was like he went mainstream with death pool. Everybody yeah, takes yeah. him now. But I said to Dennis, I was filling up my Sucks roster. his own dick to restart his heart. <laughs> <laughs> Very odd way to. It's like the old Model T you it. have to crank. <laughs> I, uh, so I said to Dennis, as I'm sitting there in his house, I said, hey, I'm filling out my roster and uh you got diabetes like you're in your 70s now would it offend you if i considered you you know for the roster and at first he wasn't sure he he didn't know how he felt about it but then i pointed out to him that he was not in the pool but air force amy was and that was it he was like get me in that fucking death pool what yeah, do i have to he's do in now yeah oh hell yeah he's yeah, yeah. in now i mean i i think i submitted it on his behalf yeah, oh, at yeah, that point, yeah, might have been your, he your he can't have one of his hookers. Air Force Amy also in my yeah. book. Yeah, he uh, can't have one of his hookers in there and him not be in it. Dennis Hoff, because you, <laughs> what, what's his fucking some uh, uh, Negro? Uh, I don't know if he's a basketball player or oh, a rapper. Lamar Odom. Yeah, 
more of them. Yeah. yeah. Basketball? You know, yeah. Basketball. basketball. I don't know. You know about it as much as I did about him, actually. Well, yeah. But you were at the Bunny Ranch when he yeah, had he some saved his kind life. of... I was I was at yeah. the Love Ranch, which is the sister house. Dennis Bad. owns he's the Sam Walton of legal prostitution. He owns seven brothels total in Nevada, which um, is like owning seven trailer parks in Nevada. Nevada. He's uh this this particular one though is the one that's closest to Las Vegas. So I was in there, um, undoubtedly drafting some completely legitimate press release about a very earnest, uh, media initiative we had, some story we were going to float out there. And, uh, I happened to be the only, I knew Lamar Odom was there because he had been there for a couple of days, much like the Stanhope compound here. Uh, it is sprawling out there at the Love Ranch, and there's a lot. There's a big house and a guest house and bungalows and such. So he had been in like the big high roller VIP house for a couple of days. Knew he was back. We have there. a lot of trailers too. Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I hadn't seen him, and so it was like a Tuesday afternoon or something. And uh, I'm sitting in the office on the computer, and one of the hookers comes running into the office. Door flies open. Oh my God, Richard, come hurry. Something's happened to Lamar. Something, something's wrong. So I jump up, go running all the way across the property to the back house. She's trying to keep up with me, like wearing only heels, you know, <laughs> and, uh, clack, 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 yeah, clack. exactly. We get into the room. He is, uh, on his back snoring like ungodly loud, like something is very wrong, like a coma kind of something's not good. So uh, he had two girls in there, the one that came and got me and then another one who's equally freaking out when I get into the room. And uh, so I get up on the you bed. You fucked him into a coma. No, you <laughs> fucked him into a coma. I don't have insurance. We don't have insurance. Dennis Hoff doesn't give us insurance. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So I get up on the on the bed. But first thing I knew is he shouldn't be on his back. So I I got him over on the side. I actually employed a little jujitsu. Went uh went Z guard on him. Uh, to get him over, uh, on his, on his side. And when I did, shit just came out everywhere, like puke, blood, piss, just uh, out of his, you all know. holes evacuated. Yeah. All over me. And so, so I, I look over at them and I go, okay, get, first give me the phone. So I got the phone. He looked over at them and said, how much would you get paid to get shit puked and pissed on? Because I'm going to ask for the same amount yeah. of money. Yeah, I need to be cut into this party. What would you do so, for Klondike Bar? So, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what it had cost him, actually. Uh, it, he, we had run his uh, Amex black card for $75,000. Jesus. And he was going to run it for more hey, if he uh, hadn't I'm overheated. I'm sorry. Uh, I have to stop you because yeah. Amex is a sponsor. Oh, uh-huh. and It's uh, not a black card for black people. <laughs> right. <laughs> they have the same card for all races. Go ahead. No, that's, that's, uh, thank you for clarifying that. And, uh, so I got, I got, I'm prop, the guy's like 300 pounds. I mean, he's a giant. So I got, I got him propped up on his side. So he won't aspirate. I got the phone under this, uh, uh, ear. If you hear the 911 call, you hear my voice on there and you hear me actually on the 911 call. It's online asking girls. Did you do radio voice? Hey, nine one one. What's your emergency? Real tight. I'll formatics. tell you what my emergency is. Yeah. What's your name? Fifth, caller, first time caller, long time listener. Ten minutes after the hour here at Love Ranch Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> done. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, we got traffic and weather. Uh, but uh, so so I'm on. <laughs> so I'm on the nine one one call. 911 operator answers, tell her what's going on. She goes, okay, what is he taking? So I say to the girls, okay, tell me everything he's taking. They point to uh, like an empty bottle of Cavassier that he has consumed, but he is a giant. He's been in there for a couple of days, so maybe that's not the end of the world. Uh, they tell me that he did a he, – he told them he had done a small amount of cocaine before arriving, of course, because we would have the zero-tolerance drug policy. But then she holds up this packet hey, politics. of something. Yes. <laughs> I do work in the PR department. Uh, she, uh, she holds up this packet. It's, it's a big room. So I actually can't see the packet of whatever she's holding up. She goes, and he took this and she throws it to me and I look at it and it's one of these truck stop dick pill things. It's called 
reload and it actually has like a picture of a a woman like blowing the end of a pistol you know and that's where the red caps <laughs> cap what is and i go uh i i'm reading the dosage and everything to the 911 operator and it says like take one per day or something like that maximum and i said to one of the hookers i said one How? per whore yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Did you describe it to the 911 yeah. operator as a truck stop boner fill? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, kind of. I think I said reload and I'm, yeah, the dosage and everything. So, so I, I said, how many of these did he take? And she goes, probably like 12. So it turns out that is what really caused, cause he started having many strokes. So he's basically in a coma at this point. So the, the 911 people are on their way. Um, a reader of the dosage and everything. When the paramedics get there, now keep in mind, this is out in the hinterlands. I mean, this is an hour outside of Las Vegas. No whorehouse. If, if you've never <laughs> been to Nevada and you think prostitution is legal, it is in the very outskirts of where they find uh, UFOs and shit. Yeah. It's not, oh, I'll leave the Bellagio and then go to the whorehouse next door. No, no you have to go out into where <laughs> it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's not legal in Clark County because it's overpopulation, 250,000. Yeah, you Anywhere could. outside of Clark County, so Nye County and all that, that's where Yeah, it's, you got to get over the county you know, line. For people yeah. who live in New Jersey where a county <laughs> is 10 minutes away yeah, 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 from no. the next It's a good hour drive. Yes. You're driving oh, an hour. Yes. In that's the a, dark. It, that's and, why we have free limo service, and you by get, the way. Yeah. You know, abducted by a UFO on yeah, the way. Yeah. No, no, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So then, so then the paramedics show up. Okay. So they come in the room and, uh, at first I'm thinking, okay, they don't seem to be in a real hurry. So maybe this is good because, uh, I was worried about this situation, but maybe they're looking at him and going, this will be okay. I well, later he just over reloaded. He didn't over. No, I later <laughs> find out that yeah, they bro. weren't in a real hurry because they assessed the situation and basically were proclaiming him a goner. Oh, so they were just kind of like, you know, I didn't want to step on your dick. I thought yeah. you were going to say that they were like sizing up the whores they could bang <laughs> for free. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, so, but so, so he's he, on this. He was dead. That's what they were thinking. Yeah. So he's, so he's, so he's on the bed. Uh, there's four of us. We each pick up a corner of the bed sheet. Okay. And we hold it, uh, the grip style like this and carry him like in a hammock out to the, uh, ambulance because he won't fit on the stretcher. Uh, for the listener, there's four corners to a sheet. Yeah. <laughs> there's three EMTs who I assume are Frank Mir size. Yeah. And then there's you. Yeah. Who look like you failed at uh, Def Leppard. Sure. <laughs> and and probably did along the way. And that's it. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. There's four of us carrying the body out. Three of us are medically licensed to do so. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you're wheezing. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't realize this guy's so heavy. So we start carrying it. Well, I'm the guy that's fake lift in his corner is what I'm doing. You know, like that friend yeah, that you're the you worst move. Paul Bearer ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He has grass stains on his head. What? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Not my well, problem. <laughs> well, that that actually, when we got him out in the daylight and I'm looking down at him, that's when I realized, like, it really sank in, like, I think I might be looking at a dead guy or, like, a nearly dead guy. We get him in the ambulance. I go to the hospital. With, by, now we have to go to Pahrump because that is the closest podunk town, but the oh, one that actually has a hospital. It's an ugly town. Yeah, yeah. Oof, I believe sad. you did some uh, some. Call we, we some just, call centering out there, didn't you? Uh, for a minute, yeah, and, yeah. But yeah. we've driven through there to. It's it's yeah. the ugliest fucking trailer park town ever. It's rough. So we we can we, I understand yeah. something real quick? Yeah. You were obligated to go along with this as far, or you were just like He's a good guy? Yeah, yeah. You just, story. You're following yeah. the story. Uh, Richard's okay. a, uh, a, a notoriously good guy. Yeah. Did, yeah, I mean, I did feel so, a sense of obligation, and yes, yeah, you I stayed was, at the hospital with him too. Yeah, so that's yeah, right. So we, we did. so we get, yeah. we get to the hospital and, uh, uh, they, they get him in the room. Now at this point, this is why I find out how bad it is. Like they come out and I, they, doctor probably wouldn't even supposed to be telling me this because I'm not like family or anything, but he's like, listen. But you look so upstanding. <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah. <laughs> he goes, he goes, listen, there's, there's like a really good chance he doesn't make it out of here. So I'm just processing that information. Now get this. This is the really like shady, weird part of this, uh, one part is that, 
this guy show, like this mystery figure shows up. This, this, uh, very large man of color, about, about Frank's size here. And he comes King up to Mo? me. Uh, King Mo's a middle one. <laughs> like this guy, this guy was actually a legit hulking dude. And he calls me over and he goes, uh, Listen, I work for, uh, uh, the Kardashians and, uh, you know, Mr. Odom. And, and no one knew we were there, by the way. So obviously he had been, you know, tipped off. Some. He's like, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to need to get, uh, Mr. Odom's, he's got two cell phones, his backpack, some other things. He had shown up at the brothel with non-disclosure agreements printed out for all the hookers to sign. This so, is where we're going next. Yeah. So this guy wants to get a hold of all the paperwork and everything, right? This is the best part, though. And, Doug, you'll appreciate this knowing Dennis Hoff as you do. He, That's where we're going he, next. He puts his hand on around me, or his uh, arm, and he goes, listen, right now, no one knows that this has happened, okay? And I am sure that your boss, <laughs> Mr. Hoff, would like to keep a tight lid on this, not have this get out. And I'm like... Oh boy, yeah, you, you know him. Yeah, that's spot on. Yeah, he would not want any publicity off of this whatsoever. <laughs> but so yeah, how do we keep the world from finding out about this, right? So as he's saying this to me, thinking, you know, that that's going to resonate with me, I, my phone's ringing. It's Dennis, right? So I, excuse me, hold on, I have to take this call. Answer the phone. Then it's like, okay, so, uh, I've talked to TMZ. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the National Enquirer is calling. Now, what I've got an order here. I want you to talk to these guys first, okay? Because we, we told them they could have an exclusive. And then we're going here and then we're going. I mean, he was already mapping the whole thing out. It's, it, it hit me about. 24 hours into it when I was on Nancy Grace's show. Oh, no. oh You're and the I, biggest sellout ever now. <laughs> well, no, I understand. I always respected you no, kind of until now. Understand. I, now, now, here's here's the thing. I mean, not that, look, I, 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 I don't mind doing media either, but most times. I actually did say to Dennis that in a moment of naivete, I said, you know, what we should do is write a tasteful statement. Let's just put that out and then decline any further comment. That'll be the most respectful way of handling that. And I even did when the the satellite truck started showing up, because then the Perump Sheriff shows up. This is the biggest thing this town's ever yeah. seen. And the Perump Since Sheriff. Heidi Fleiss. Yeah, <laughs> moved in with her parrots. Yes. And so the, <laughs> so the sheriff shows up. And he's like, hee hee, all right. Now listen, there's a whole cavalcade of press coming down from LA, you know. Cause Here's how you pronounce my name. Yeah. <laughs> Don't fuck it up. He says, all the satellite trucks are coming. So within a few hours, we got CNN, a Good Morning America. They're all out there. So the first interview I did with CNN, and I actually, after Dennison said, no, we got to do these interviews, because he was up in Reno. So I'm down here doing these on the scene. I asked the first interview to shoot me from the side because I was embarrassed to like be on camera talking about this. And they shot me from the side and my cell phone went off as I'm doing it. And it was a friend of mine going, dude, we can totally recognize that that is you. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, the floodgates open 24 hours later, I'm doing Nancy Grace. And that was rock bottom. I had the same feelings, Doug. And I'm like, oh, this is going to suck. I, uh, this is going to suck. But I, I have a similar story that I'm not going to interrupt you, but, but I understand. Here was the best part, though. Here was the best part. She had Dennis on split screen with me. Dennis is up in Reno. I'm down in Bay because Dennis with has figured two out whores on either side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet it. <laughs> yeah, did he crying on command? Absolutely, because this was you know the 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 worst day in the history of you know that yeah that exactly on either side of him. So I'm thinking this is going to suck. She's going to skewer me, but. She, Dennis is the, 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 the Washington generals to her Harlem Globetrotters. She wants to beat up on Dennis, who she keeps referring to as a smut peddler. So she beats up on him. But then when she cuts to me, she goes, and now the guardian angel who saved Lamar Odom's life. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait, I'm one of the good guys on this show. <laughs> And she just Fuck spends you, 10 hilarious. minutes painting me as this good Samaritan. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So Dennis ben, Hoff, when I, I, we filmed up there for yeah, the man show. The Bunny Ranch. Yeah, you were there. At the Bunny Ranch. And <clears throat> Dennis Hoff immediately tells me and Rogan, oh, I got to talk to you about Rogan. See, I get my fucking segues good. Says, oh, welcome 
hey, you know what? We're, I think we, it was three days we're going to film there. And he's like, you, uh, you, you get a carte blanche. I'm going to... Uh, but you can fuck any one of my whores and I'm going to take care of your first one on the house. And and then he starts telling us all, Carrot Top has fucked my whores and this guy has fucked my whores. And, and I was in a relationship at the time and Rogan didn't care. He goes, Rogan says, uh, I'll pass because... Uh, I don't want to be in the litany of names you drop of people who fuck your whores. And to Dennis Hoff's credit, he goes, I only mention names of people who are already public about yes. okay. going there. But it was still awkward. <clears throat> but I was in a relationship, and that's when I jerked off on Air Force Amy, because she's so fucking funny. We hung out the whole time, and she, we just joked. And I go, well, you're going to get paid if I go back to your room, so just dildo yourself, and I'll just jerk off. Uh, that way, it's, it's not cheating if I just jerk off and you put a no. dildo in yourself. You want to keep it respectful. <laughs> and then there was, I, I, and I jerk off all over whatever T-shirt wardrobe had given me. And... Uh, and then I come out, and there was this one asshole on the production crew, assistant, fucking whatever. We all hated him. We, we called him Man Dick. And uh, I come out. I'm fucking just withered in my own jizz on my shirt. is just dripping off of me. And I go, hey, Man Dick, great shoot, as he's collecting up all the gear and I hug him and then I start smearing my shirt into him and then other people who know where I just came from are laughing and he's like oh Jesus I'm on fire oh god baby, you fucking but, hashtag me too exactly uh, but Hoff just, just the re most relentless Self promoter, and I don't know if you've ever had to do this. Which part are we talking about? <laughs> Mir, I've had to go on Stern. I've had to go on your show to promote Girls Gone Wild, where I go, I know this is a piece of shit, but I'm contractually obligated to promote this. So I have to go on. Have you ever had a fight where you go, yeah, this is a tomato can, but I have to. Dana made me. No, uh, for what it's for good or for worse, it drives my wife nuts. But so far, uh, one thing that kind of I've been lucky about is I've always picked the hardest fights I could possibly get. You know, if they ever gave me an option between all right, here's a safe route and here's a dangerous route, I've always you get an option. Yeah, they usually come at you with a two because a lot of guys turn fights down. And then after a while, they just realized that I wasn't going to turn anything down. So they just call me up. All right, we're going to have you fight this guy. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, you, you know where that I'll bet more like what Doug's talking about, though, like a lot of times fighters, because of their their name recognition, will get cast in some like straight to DVD movie or yeah, something like that. that. And then sometimes the, the the PR company might have you promoting that or some product or something have like that. Have you ever had to promote something that you were, yeah, well, knew was bullshit? You know what? Actually, sometimes it happens to us, and it's funny because no, we all have sponsors. Well, here's the way I, I do it, <laughs> because of exactly what you're saying. There's you get in the back of the production, right? We do that whole montage of you watch a fight where you're sitting there talking shit about your opponent, right? And for a while there, it's like, well, I honestly, don't have a problem with the guy on a personal level, you know. But then I could figure out what I would say. I was like, all right, well, I'm kind of a smart ass, so instead of me sitting there going, I'm going to kill this guy because I don't like him, I'm like that's not true. I like the guy, but you know what? He sucks at this. And he's not very good at this. And I'm going to call you on it. And you're not very good at this. And then people started, you know, it was my way of sidestepping that fake animosity. Cause I always hate that when I see two guys pretend they don't like each other. And as soon as the fight's over with, they're like, Oh, we just did it to sell the fight. I'm all. That's kind of stupid. You know it seems mean? like it's gotten a lot worse recently. It's UFC. Well, it seems more like watching wrestling for most yeah, of the time. Yeah, it gets that way. Whereas there's a lot of truth. Like, I remember one time I was in a fight, a guy named Chet Congo, right? Yeah. A yeah, French guy, yeah. good fighter, really good striker. And the guy's built like an Adonis. I mean, the guy has like a 34 inch waist and a heavyweight. Like, a sick, oh. the guy is shredded to the bone, you know, is what I want to look like when I grow up. <laughs> like, and so, uh, Getting ready for the fight, you know, I was like, oh, well, you know, he, he sucks on the ground. He has no ground game. 
And to the point where it was funny because he's no toe bar guy. Yeah, he was one of the, <laughs> but like, it like, wasn't like I was like making us shit up. Strong men. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't like I was making anything up. Uh, to the point to where I remember he wasn't talking to me the week of the fight. Like every time he walked by, me he just kind of dogged me. And I'm like, hey, whatever you got to do to get in the mood, you know what I mean? Yeah. Each to his own. I've always been more of like a sociopath approach. Like I could be your best friend once you say go, I'm going to break your neck. You know what I mean? Like it just, I don't care. You know, like it doesn't Catching. matter. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just it's just like being a hitman. You know what I mean? If you're the you're the mark, you're the mark. I don't care Catching. who you are. <laughs> and so, um, he obviously is one of those guys. I thought, how do you get worked up? So I remember I sat in the seat, right? And uh, they're like, okay. And, and at first, they usually will feed you shit. Now they're not talking to me. I'm like, hey, so what's up? They're like, oh yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, and he did his interview before me. Like, well, what did he say about me? He goes, oh, and usually they'll try to make something up to try to get you fired up. And now the guy, I know the you know production crew, and they're sitting there kind of doing the like, they don't want to talk to me. I'm like, wow, you're selling this good, man. What happened? Like, he says after he knocks you out, he's going to piss on you. Oh. I was like, what? Yeah, he doesn't like that you said that you're he's bad on the ground. I'm like, well, hold the fuck up. That's a different thing. Yeah. No, but it's the truth. I'm like, yo, if all of us in the UFC got into a ground fight right now, this motherfucker ain't beating anybody. I mean, like, if we had a tournament on jujitsu skills, he's coming dead last. I didn't say he was fat, which would have been stupid. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I gave him credit where credit's due, but you know what? Everybody has flaws in their game. I'm going to call you out on it because then that sells. You know, it's the truth. I can stand by it. That is exactly what we were talking about. When you have to sell both. Yeah. You have to. Have you, you, you find ever an angle on it. Do the, uh, the, the pregame thing. Where well, you- I, I do get limited a lot. And that part sucks because, you know. <laughs> wait, wait. So you like to do that pregame where you pretend to fight at the weigh-in shit? No, I won't do it unless it's real. If I really don't like you, then then I'm okay with trying to, you know, before. If we're okay with each other, we're okay with each other. But as far as, like, you know, his situation. Have you ever lied? No. No, in fact, if anything, I get cut back. Like I said, my wife, a lot of times, like, I'm going to say this. She's like, please, oh, God, don't say that. I'm like, oh, you know, this would be good. I'm going to go here. So don't. I get. actually asked your wife a couple questions while you're up. Uh, don't go there. Don't go there. Cigars. And she, uh, yeah, she told me some stuff. Yeah. Well, I no. And, and Richard now is my other guy. He, like, cause I remember I called him up to find out, like, cause I heard about the Lamar Odom thing, right? It's happening. It's going on. And I'm like, Hey, man, are you all right? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I'm all, Hey. Would it be funny if I tweeted that, can we change it from party like a rock star to party like Lamar Odom? <laughs> and then he texts me back. He goes, can we at least wait to find out if he lives? I'm like, it's not going to be as funny, man. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what he says. You are a comic. It's a not, uh, not a good idea. I'm like, ah, shit. So half the time I'm up there, like people will ask me a question or something. And then that's why you'll see me sometimes like I have to do the stare at my wife. She's my conscious. Oh, yeah, is that okay if I talk freely? And she's like, no. no. <laughs> she's like, remember the uh, the Brock Lesnar thing? Don't. don't uh, I, I, yeah, I was still thinking at that point that there was just some minimal level, like some low bar that we wouldn't go below, like uh, in the Lamar. So I should have known better, though, because you actually reminded me, Doug, when you are uh, talking about that. Uh, about two years prior to that, <clears throat> We'd done this contest with the Bunny Ranch with Stern, and it was get my grandpa laid. Oh, this is awesome. Yeah. Right? And so the deal was that uh, you brought your grandpa on Stern, and uh, you told him the sob story. You know, they were widowed, whatever. And then the, the saddest one got a free hooker at the Bunny Ranch. So this yeah. guy brings his grand, grandpa Johnny on, his grand grandfather. And grandpa Johnny had been widowed for a number of years and all this. So he ends up winning the trip. Stern sends him down to the Bunny Ranch. Guy comes in and he, and the guy was in his eighties. So he comes in, he's all excited and he's picked his girl out that he wants, uh, caress the kisses. And so, you know, he comes in, where's Carissa? Hee hee. You know, come on, let's go. <laughs> and, uh, his, gr- up on that. yeah. So his grandson, and she's there and they're all ready to go. Well, his grandson says, you know, grandpa Johnny, since we're here and Tahoe is 20 minutes away, you know, why don't we not rush into anything? Let's go have a nice dinner before you do your business. So he's all right. Uh, Chris, I'll be back for you a little bit. Yee, you know, and so out they go. Bunny Ranch Limo takes him up to Tahoe, uh, a steakhouse up there. They sit down. He orders a big steak, takes the first bite of the steak, chokes on it and drops dead right there at the table. The story gets better. The story gets way better. So 
So I get this text from Dennis. Now, this is a very high-profile contest because obviously Stern is supposed to have Grandpa Johnny on for the exit interview, right? And the next day. And so I get this text from Dennis, and it says, you know, Grandpa Johnny just dropped dead at the table uh, at the steakhouse. He texts me this, and it's like 5 a.m. or something. And I look at it, and I'm Maybe like... Maybe a gold. Well, here's the thing. I'm like, caps. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, like, and I'm about to text, oh, that's horrible. I hope, you know, is his grandson okay? And before I can do that, you know, I see the bubble coming up with the next text. And exactly, it says, get here right away. We've got to get the press release together. we got to figure out what we're... So so I go in there. I I thought I... I felt bad about it until I found this, this out. This is the best part of the story. That... As they were loading Grandpa Johnny's corpse onto the ambulance, <laughs> the grandson reached in Grandpa Johnny's sport coat pocket and pulled out the voucher for the free hooker, took it to the bunny ranch, and redeemed it for himself a few hours later, claiming it as a tribute Absolutely. to his fallen grandfather, <laughs> that that's how his grandfather would have wanted it. Yes. <laughs> this is a good place to break because yeah. we both... Both the phone booth fighting podcast and the Doug Stanhope podcast have to break to bring you beautiful sponsors. And we'll be right back after we all take a piss because we've been drinking quite a bit. Please hold. Hey, pop off vodka. We haven't, uh, uh, our, our long term, our longest sponsor. We haven't, uh, pitched pop-off vodka for a while. Hey, pop-off vodka, people. It's a plastic jug so big you can crawl inside with all of your deepest fears and still fit comfortably. Pop-off vodka. Go down uh, to the bottomest shelf of your local barred window retail liquor establishment in that part of town. Get yourself a bottle of pop-off vodka. It makes you smile like you just got 500 surprise dollars in the mail. And now back to the podcast, already drinking pop off vodka. <laughs> All right, Jaylee, cut this out or leave it in. It doesn't matter. Uh, we did uh, some due diligence. Uh, Frank Muir just trying to interview the wife. <laughs> well, we, yeah, we did that later when she showed up. But uh, I went. I'm gonna. Uh, uh, call Rogan, text Rogan. Go, hey, Mir's gonna be here tomorrow for a podcast. You got Nathan to fuck with him about? And all he had was that you are well armed all the time. <laughs> mm. But not right now. I got off a plane. Yeah. <laughs> well, both Chad Shank and Joby are overly well armed yeah. all the time. So we <laughs> thought <laughs> last <laughs> night, still drunk. Three days later from the Super Bowl, let's just have guns everywhere, wear guns on our back. <laughs> Never acknowledge it. Bandoliers. Yeah. Just like, yeah. If you're in my home, if you're in my house or when I'm in Vegas, uh, when you guys come to Vegas, if Absolutely. you drive, yeah. I'll show you everything I carry with me. Actually, Perfect. Uh, yeah, you, you know where, you know where I'll have competitions with people like who has more guns or knives on them? No, that's great because my guns, my, all my guns identify as super soakers. So if you, okay. you know, so there's, you know, what? Okay. you know where that could work actually is because you tell that story about when you were on stage with the, with the first time stand up with all the guns and stuff <laughs> and you had to pull. There, there's a good story if you want to on where he, if, if Don't you're asking burn about your the material guns. on a no, podcast. No, no, no. Well, no, it wasn't. No. only done it four we're times. We're doing our no, podcast. It now. No, well, it, we were doing a thing. Uh, he came up with an idea where he has to name that tune before I choke him out. Yeah, so I get, that I get was a, great. Right, so I get in a position where I'm going to you know, land a submission on uh, 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 Richie, and uh, it'll start playing a song. And he has to name the song before I can crank him. Right <laughs> on so stage good. when we're on doing stage. Stand-up. So we go to sit down. He goes, "Oh, position." I go to get there and I go to move, and I'm like, oh, "Hold on a second. So I had to leave the stage real quick. To disarm because I had too many knives and guns and I'm like, oh, if we start rolling so, on the ground, I'm like, the whole stage is going to freak the fuck out of a Glock goes sliding across. <laughs> so, perfect. you know, the table, like there's the stool and then there's always the table where you can set your drink or whatever. Frank just starts flipping out their gun. There's a couple of knives on the table and everything. And it's okay. Now I'm ready. We get down the floor. It's safe. No one's going to get poked. It's, it's, it's very strange where <laughs> I will not own a gun because I know I have. Napoleon <sighs> complex. Oh, like if I'm drunk. Yeah, a drunk 
fucking weak guy should not have a gun because I'd use it inappropriately. You don't want to, you don't want to live out your golden years like Phil Spector. Well, but it's also <laughs> odd that a guy that can fucking crush anyone in the street generally has a million guns. Well, and that's because, I mean, growing up in Vegas, I learned really quick that, like, look, especially now, uh, it's not like I'm unknown. If someone walks out and they see me and they're going to be up to no good, they're not going to go fist test cuffs you. with yeah. me. You know what I mean? Like, and, and if they wanted to, then I won't pull anything out. It's like, all right, you just want a fist fight real quick? All right, let me show you <laughs> the errors of your ways. And I, uh, <laughs> But then you get arrested because you won. Well, that's if I'm still well, there and they can remember what happened. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, the key. That's, that's always the key is to win in the fight fast and leaving. Yeah. But, but I mean, fights. if you think about it, most guys don't carjack people fisticuffs. It makes, I mean, they pull out a yeah. knife, a gun. And, and most of the time, I mean, uh, I have my wife and my kids with me. So running from a situation, like people are like, oh, you just try to avoid confrontation. I'm all, what if that's not possible? You know, what if I'm in a situation? I'm at the gas station. A guy walks me to pump. My kids are in the car. You know, I mean, it's like one of those things where it's like, well, fuck, man, it's either you die or I die. or And if I die, what's going to happen to my kids and my wife? So I'm the last line of defense here. So losing is not an option. It's not a sport fight where it's like, ah, oh, shit, I lost this one. In a street I, fight, it's I, like, oh, I can't afford to lose. You have to die. You know? Rogan, agree. Yeah, when, yeah. when Rogan 100%. and I were doing the man show, he was also doing Fear Factor at the same time. So he'd do 14 hours a day on Fear Factor stop by the writer's room afterwards, chime in, and then uh, go do an hour at the comedy store for nothing. He's a fucking monster, just like you are at... And and train. Yeah. It's just fucking... You, it doesn't make sense to me what you fucking weirdo, fucking freak <laughs> people do. But he'd come by... And we go, yeah, we pitched this bit and they won't do it. He's like, fuck him. I'll choke that guy out. He's always, <laughs> I'll fucking choke that fuck out. What? The, the producer or whoever. That's not Frank's style. When, no, no, wait, wait. Yeah. Let's yeah. yeah. go somewhere. Yeah. At some point, I said, Rogan, when, when were you ever in an actual fight? Because he was always going to choke some fucking guy out. He goes, like a real fight? Nah, I've never been in a real fight. Because some fucking crazy guy will just pick up a beer bottle and cut your fucking eye out. True. Yeah. We we were doing a tape on a podcast one night in a bar. And we were, were sitting there, and these there this drunk guy comes walking by out on a patio. And he leans over to Frank, and he's like, Ah, Frank, man. he's just leaning in, and he's leaning into the microphone, which is going on the podcast. Well, Frank takes podcasting very seriously. And his buddy had gone to the bathroom, right? These two guys together. One guy goes to the bathroom. This other one's being this drunk asshole. So Frank gets up. I mean, the guy, Frank doesn't like to be touched if you don't know him or whatever. And the guy's like got his arm around his throat and everything. Frank gets up from the podcast. Excuse me for a minute. He walks over to the side and he goes, listen, that was very rude. Now, we, if you see over here, we're taping a podcast. And he goes, there's a lot of work that this goes Frank, into this. Same. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like, there's a lot of work that goes into this. And what you caused is now this is going to have to be edited out. And someone has to do the work. Now, in the meantime, his buddy comes out from the bathroom, recognizes Frank, and recognizes his drunk asshole friend has obviously caused some sort of problem with him. So the, the buddy's like... Holy shit, it's Frank, this Frank Mirror's gonna kill my friend, whatever just happened. But instead, Frank's giving him this very sincere, so, you know, really, you should apologize for what just in the guy, you know, you remember that? Yeah. You were giving him this, like, talking to, like it was your kid. Well, and that's also true, cause anytime I've had, especially like, I worked for eight years at a club, and I've always felt that if I'm gonna Spearmint get- Spearmint Rhino, yeah. doorman. So, and I always made sure that if I ever got violent with somebody, that when it was over with, you knew you deserved it. You know what I mean? I never wanted to be that dick that was just looking to cause a fight. I gave people alternatives to a situation. Like, okay, we can solve the problem this way, we can solve the problem that way. But if a guy just was going to be hard-headed and go in a certain direction, there's nobody in the eight years that I worked there that ever got their ass kicked by me that the next day couldn't wake up going, ah, fuck, I had that sorry. coming. I mean, ah, fuck. Sorry. I, because that you know was me. I'm sorry. Because I seen guys get shot that way. And I don't care how badass you are with a gun, a knife. If you have some guy waiting out you by your car and he's already pointing in, you're fucked. So my mentality was like, okay, I'm never going to, 
uh, undeservedly hand out an ass whooping because that festers with people. You know, if I just whoop your ass and you're like, dude, you're just being a bully. You're a fucking dick. That guy goes home. He sits there, realizes who I am, realizes he can't fuck me up in a fight anyways. So then he goes and he grabs his little 38 and he waits for me by his car to regain his manhood. I'm fucked now. You know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do? That's why I don't own And Frank's Frank's discreet about it, too. Like, I remember we went to the liquor store early on in our friendship and uh i made a run up there at night and we're getting out of the car and i knew Deep frank Bellum. always uh no no it was a nice part of t- yeah. part of dallas north dallas but or uh vegas. north uh, vegas but uh we we get out of the car the nice part of north vegas going Sorry, yeah <laughs> summerlin summerlin <laughs> not north vegas summerlin That's geographically the Hills area. accurate so anyway we go to this we go to this liquor store and i knew frank had you know, the gun in the car and he always has the gun on him and everything but he's discreet about it it's not like he's twirling it on his finger so we get out of the car and as he's readjusting his sweatpants where he's got his gun down there by his nether regions and i'm getting out of the car this guy comes walking by and he goes oh hey frank mirror big fan (laughs) frank waves with the hand that's not down his pants and i thought to myself (laughs) in that moment that guy either thinks that frank is making sure he's got his gun on him or Frank just got a blowjob from that drifter that just got out of the car. <laughs> or Frank Mir jerks off every time he's recognized. <laughs> I don't want to close this podcast without getting back to this. Yeah. Because we no, talked no, about no, this really outside. Good. I go, I want to talk to you about this off the air. On air. But you, yeah. but you brought it to a place where we can talk yeah. about it on the air. Is... uh. Now you're with Bellator. Yep. Instead of UFC, Chad Shank smokes a lot of pot. <laughs> I'm not calling him out, but it's been known Chad Shank smokes a lot of pot. Yeah, so we both th- said we're going to smoke outside my cigarettes and his pot. Yeah, you so guys are trying to get, test dirty. Yeah, you guys were talking about so I don't have to, and that's why I informed you, not that I. But you were talking about other fighters that, that will do drugs that taking Xanax and. Well, it, it's an old comedy tome of uh, hey, they, uh, hey, hey, why would you smoke pot to be a better athlete? It doesn't make sense. Is the the hackneyed premise, but he was talking about yeah well people have panic attacks yeah yeah well so uh, pot and xanax and stuff that you would never think would be a yeah performance well, enhancing i guess how the conversation started because you guys are worried about if i smoke weed around you, you'll test right. positive I'm like well they don't care if i have recreational drugs in my system or any fighter leading up to a fight they have two types of drug testing in competition and out of competition out of competition PEDs, steroids, all that stuff's always illegal in both. Then in competition, there's certain drugs they feel alters your mind and might get you hurt. Uh, so you can smoke weed up to a fight and then, you know, a couple of days out, you have to stop because you have to have such a, uh, only allowed so many nanobytes per milliliter in your blood. Basically, you, you don't want you high in a fight. So and like you, Diaz smoked too much weed whenever he would, cause he kept right. being busted for that. So and the problem okay. with that is when guys sit there and go, well, why are you smoking weed before a fight? And that's what I told you guys that like, look, man, a lot of fighters panic their ass off. They have, like for the Diaz brothers, they're not stressed about fighting people. They like to fight people. If you go see one of them in the you know, superstore right now and you want to fight him, uh, yeah. he's not going to have an issue with fighting you. Uh, it's not going to stress him out. Uh, I, Start talking to him with three people around you and go, hey, it's Nate or it's Nick. You know, talk to him. He's going to panic the fuck off his ass. Uh, they have social anxiety. Yeah. So people don't realize that that's another aspect of fighting. Just like in comedy, you're, you're not just fighting somebody. And it makes me nervous, too. You're walking out in front of 15,000 screaming people, live cameras. That idea can build social anxiety. You're stressed the fuck out. It's like, you know, it's like giving a speech at the front of your class, you know. And so guys times sometimes. a thousand. Right. Yeah. So that's why a lot of fighters, when it comes to weed, get in trouble yeah. because they actually do it to calm the fuck down. Yeah. They're trying to relax. Like, oh, fuck, I'm stressed out of my mind. It's the night before the fight. I can't sleep. I'm sitting there jittery as shit. <laughs> and if they already have a crutch upon, they found a system of self-medicating where it's like, well, a little THC mellows me the fuck out. I'm not, you know, out of my mind. Then they do it again. And then now it's they're too close to fight. It's not helping you win a fight. No. It's helping you get through a fight. Right. It's helping you get a good night's sleep the night before, relaxing. But in sports where, oh, performance... As a comic, I'm a. I could not do comedy without being drunk, and sometimes Adderall 
if I'm too drunk, where you, like if they put the same rules on comedy, ah, uh, that's yeah, actually my opening what? bit. He, 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 <laughs> he, he, he <laughs> nice. pissed it. He pissed negative. He's not really a funny comic. No, I have to do a lot of fucking yeah. different drugs. To get through a fucking show. That's the first 30 seconds of my stand-up where I sit there and talk about basically like, hey, I don't know if uh, comedy is going to be a new career for me, but at least I know I won't be in trouble for failing a drug test. (laughs) In fact, in comedy, the only way really to fail a drug test is like the OD. (laughs) (laughs) Very true. (laughs) Right? But, uh, and I'm sure someone's done a bit about it. I don't want to be a Carlos Mencia here, Mm -hmm. but... If they did enforce those rules on art the same way they do sports, where oh uh, no he yeah he seemed funny that night, but yeah he was on a lot of drugs. Mm. And we do have a weird obsession in our culture. I mean Jesus, we had fucking uh, baseball players in front of a fucking uh, congressional hearing answering questions, yeah. which I thought was odd. I'm like, hey, wait a minute, man. My kids play baseball. These guys just get paid to play baseball. This is something our government should be wasting time on. I'm watching on CNN right now. Like, it's but a Kane sp- try to do something with boxing. Fucking no, no, the documentary you had to have seen. No, 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 no is the, a thirty the, for thirty. The the no hitter. Uh, yeah, on, he threw on a no LSD. hitter on acid. Oh, oh, oh I know that Doc guy. Ellis. Yeah. yeah, Doc Ellis. Doc Ellis. Good. Yeah, yep. I did see that. Yeah, it was fucking fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, just, we have a strange obsession with the athletes, and I think that's uh, but, it's weird being but, a fighter. And I don't know if com- you guys deal with this the same way we deal with it. We have no, it's like such a love hate relationship when you're a professional fighter. In one sense, we're idolized because we're like a real life fucking action character. We go out there and fight people, and fighting I think is one of the largest stigmas in our society. You're like, wait, you're gonna punch another person in the face, and you're not even mad at them? Yeah. People have a hard time. I mean, you see guys in a bar. I mean, like I said, I worked for many years in a club. I'll see a guy get another altercation with another guy. Experiment and, Rhino, <laughs> Las Vegas. And he wants to fight. And they sit there and their hands are clenched by their side. And they're, they're twitching. And they just don't know how to flip that uh, switch. Because we're taught all violence is bad. Violence is uh, bad. And then now you have this group of guys that are able to go up there and, and, and exemplify being able to be violent. And, and people just have a hard time wrapping their brain around. And then at the same time, it's almost like they hate you, too. It's like, wait a minute, you like me, but you hate me at the same time. Like, because it's like, oh, that guy's a badass. Ah, oh, fuck, that guy's a badass. He's something I wish I could be, and I'm not him. And not being comfortable with that. It's like, well, but we're all different comedy things. Comedy is always named the number one, uh, uh, public speaking is always named the number one fear of yeah. people. Mm. Yeah, so you guys, that's why you get that heckler in the crowd, probably. It's like, I wish I was that guy. So this is going to be my I 15 heckled seconds. before I did stand up. I, really? Yes. <laughs> but you, at I least you became that guy. I'm proud about it. But I'm saying everyone has a different fear. And people would say to me, well, I could never do what you do. That's so scary. Well, yeah, it would be scary for you because you would suck at it. You're good at fighting. That helps. I would yeah. be way worse at fighting someone in a ring because I suck at it. So, yeah, you but you are right. Fear is all individualized. The different people have different fear sets. So when people say, oh, you're fearless. I'm like, well, no, you just found something that you're proficient at. So it helps get rid of some of that fear. But if we found something like, I mean, shit, man, I mean, I'm afraid of heights. You put me up on a high enough dive board yes, and I yeah. freak the fuck out. Oh, yeah. I, I one time went on they have the, the three meter or was it like they have a five meter, the 10 meter, the 20 meter. I couldn't even yeah. jump off the lowest one. It took me 20 minutes. Frank, Frank, and there's some Frank, 10-year-old heckling Frank, me at the bottom Frank. before I jumped. <laughs> Frank, we have, I don't know what your podcast is about, but we do feet and yards. So meters. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Too much international I traveling, saying, man. I but, for our British audience, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't be in a restaurant that's too busy because I take on the stress of the angry waitress. Where I'll be with you in a minute. I'll be. With, I'll just go home and eat at home. I couldn't be a good waitress. You know what you you're good at. Yeah. You punch people in the face. Dick Hunter talks to OJ. Yes. Gives good CPR. That. <laughs> 
Shut I up. Shank has good fucking elbows when he's fucking collecting no, money. No, it's uh, uh, audio books. Is uh, my new <laughs> thing. Well, remember? You know the thing is though, like it's, this is actually speaking audio books, but uh, you know I also think too, like things you bring Not from audio books, your... Audible. Yes, Audible, which is where I heard Doug's audio book, Digging Up Mother. But it's like, but the reason I bring this up is because, you know, there, I think a lot of times, and I see this with Frank, like skills that he has from not only the fighting, but the PR aspect of it and public speaking aspect of it, things like that, that are actually helping him now in stand up. Like, as long as I've known you, Doug, I didn't realize until I'd read your book, all the, uh, the rich background of, uh, uh, cold calling and all the call center stuff and everything, which had to be, I mean, that, that's training that you to it. be a performer. Well, Frank, Born and raised Vegas, which I hope you don't brag about. I do a little bit. Uh, come on. <laughs> come on. Vegas is a good place to live. Well, Bisbee does that, too. I'm Bisbee native. Well, that that means you don't have a choice. <laughs> I hate tourist towns that hate tourists. Well, without Bugsy Siegel, you'd be fucking yeah. sucking water out of sand. <laughs> Coconuts in Cuba. <laughs> White people in Hawaii. Oh, you know what? This you have to respect it. You're white. You don't belong here. Anyway, I'm very drunk. <laughs> was your? I I was going to ask you a question though, Doug, about your uh uh your your call center stuff because you mentioned that guy that you worked for in Vegas that ran a call center, he Steve Sisolak. Runs the fucking town now. You know he's running for governor. Yeah. Yeah. He, he owns that fucking town, Steve Sisolak. Surely his gubernatorial campaign is in need of a celebrity endorsement. We Have uh, you been contacted well, formally Tom by the Kanopka, campaign? Tom who my listeners know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. lives in town now, Yeah, reconnected after you know, 30 years. We reached out to Steve Sisolak. He did not get back to us because he ran a telemarketing place of dubious integrity. I did not know this about him. This is the guy that started up the Vegas he got the, uh, the, the, the shooter fund and all that oh, yeah. when we did the benefit. He was yeah. it because he was on the city council. He's and, a good dude. Yeah. He fired but, me. Yeah. So. He fired Doug from a like a call center where they tell you you've won a major prize. <laughs> He was running that, right? It, you know, it, it was, again, of dubious integrity, but I stepped over the line where I went, you know what? Fuck you. I got your MasterCard number on this old lead. I'm going to fucking send a lot of Ginsu knives to your house based on your MasterCard. <laughs> yeah. So to but, me, that's an illustration of the fact that he's got integrity and he knows where the line is. Yeah, and yeah. he's the guy that brought the Raiders to uh, Vegas. No. Yeah. I, I I was fascinated to learn that from your book. <laughs> he won't he won't accept our uh, uh, acknowledgement. Hey, I'm for Steve Sisolak. <laughs> <laughs> Please vote for him. Please don't do that. He hasn't contacted you to headline that black tie fundraiser yet. <laughs> Dennis Hoff also supports Steve says, no, please don't help me. I got this. All right. Funny story that ties two of the things you actually brought up real quick. Uh, guns and name dropping, right? One time my wife, she was about nine months pregnant and she, uh, she wanted to pick up. up it was right there, right? So she wanted to pick up this device that made it easier during sex, you know, so I didn't have to be on top of her. She's big. She's heavy. And so you sell it at these adult stores, right? So I pull up in front of the adult store, and it's all windows, and I can see in. So I sit out there, and she's looking at me. I'm like, okay, go ahead. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, go in there and buy your device. You know, Take care of it. She goes, well, you're going to let me go in there? I'm like, babe, I can see inside there. She goes, what if something happens? I'm all, I have like three handguns and an AK-47 in the trunk. <laughs> you're the safest person in this zip code. <laughs> Ain't shit going to happen. I have like over 120 rounds. Trust me, you're good. She's like, well... You're not going to go with me? I'm like, no, I'm not going with you. She's like, what do you think is going to happen? The guy's going to sit there and go, oh, shit, it's Frank Mir. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I think is going to happen. You know what I mean? I think I'm going to walk in there and the guy's going to recognize me. So she finally convinces me not to let her preg my pregnant wife to walk in there by herself. So I walk in with her. So I walk in. As I walk in, the guy's sitting there and he's watching fights on his fucking TV. <laughs> I'm fighting Tank Abbott, right? And he like looks over at me. No, I swear to God. And he looks over at me and he goes, 
oh shit, it's Frank Mayer. Now the whole store stops. They look over at me. I like my head just drops. I'm like, I'm just gonna walk over to like to the big fucking black dildo section because <laughs> I'm gonna at least make this story good for him. You know, you know. So you know, so I'm walking around the store and she gets her thing and she like walks up to me and she goes, oh well, come on, you know, other people come in here all the time. I'm sure, you know, like. There has to be some discretion here. I'm like, and I'm a little convinced. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. You can't run a business and you start name dropping who's in here, right? So we walk up to the thing, the thing, and she's like, oh, you know, Frank, you know, he's like, hey, good big fan. Like, yeah, Frank was nervous to come in. He goes, oh, you shouldn't be. Carrot Top's been here. And he starts rattling off. <laughs> <laughs> so then he starts rattling off about 15 names of people I recognize in Vegas. I'm like, and then as he's saying it, I just start looking over at my wife. I'm like, I fucking hate you right now. Because <laughs> you know now I'm on that list. <laughs> so 12 years ago is... Uh, you're 12 years older than me. I started in Vegas. Do you remember the first comedy show you saw in Vegas? What was the first comedy show live? First bar you drank at in Vegas as an adult. Velvet Lounge at the uh, uh, Venetian. Nice. That was quick. Yeah. I, because I finally waited because I was kind of a nerd growing up. I never really bought alcohol or anything. You're still a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> And so I'm 21 and I walk in and I'm sitting there. And at the time I was dating a cocktail waitress who's a few years older than I am. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, like Jones and, you know, a 21 year old kid, like it's my birthday, like ID me. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'll, I remember I think I ordered a Guinness. Oh, I'll try a Guinness. The guy was like, okay, cool. And he sets it down, like walks off. I'm like, oh, fucking bullshit, man. I've been waiting this whole time. I'm not even going to get carded. <laughs> <laughs> my first uh, uh, legal drink was in Vegas at a place that I had the worst fake ID forever and then the day i turned 21 my regular bartender i go hey look at my real id i'm 21 like he'd be hey that's so cool you fucked me over and almost ruined my job <laughs> you fucking hated me family billiards on maryland and uh trop or maryland and flamingo <laughs> that's an area of town maryland flamingo <laughs> But uh, yeah, 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 my Vegas years when you were uh, you were still a kid. Yeah, it was twelve years ago. Yeah, well, I, well, I started at the Rhino. Twelve years younger. Two thousand one. So yeah, you could have stopped in the Rhino and seen me. I was a crazy horse two man. Ah. <laughs> Avoid getting your neck broken. Was it was sweet. called Industrial Boulevard back then. Yeah. Before yeah. now, it's called mm. fucking MLK or fucking yeah. JFK or something. Frank, you know where Doug lived for a while when he was in Vegas? No, no, uh, Naked City. Fun, that Fun City Motel across it's the still street there. from the Stratosphere. Yeah, we Fun drove by it there. when I because when I worked the Sahara Stratosphere. You lived in there. Fuck you. That's where I first he, lived. He lived Holy in it. shit. They all got great stories about. I guarantee coffee. you have great stories. That's yeah. like 80s, hooker crackhead. Eighty six. I was in the Fun City Motel when Tyson won his first uh, heavyweight championship in like five seconds against. Oh, who was it? He knocked out. Was it Michael uh, Spinks? Was no, that one? Spinks Trevor was Burbick? second. Trevor Burbick. Yeah, that's who he knocked. Yeah. When he knocked him out. He kept getting up and falling yeah. through the ropes. That was Trevor Burbick. Trevor, yeah. He was nineteen yeah. when he did that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I was I was cooking. On a two burner stove in the Fun City Motel, we would make 39 cent spaghetti where you'd get a little tiny can of tomato sauce and ramen noodles, 20 cents for the can of tomato sauce and 19 cents for ramen noodles. Get, and you'd boil them up in one of those aluminum pans and one time it set on fire because... We used the aluminum pan too many times and it busted a hole. Man, yeah. that, that neighborhood has not gotten any better. No, either. that's an awful fucking I, neighborhood. I worked that club in the stratosphere like twice a month. And there's, there's actually a comedian who's got a great joke about because they got those rides at the top of the stratosphere, you know, where you hang They're off still the there? side. Yeah. And he's got the greatest joke. He goes, you think the ride's scary when that car hangs you off the side, you see the neighborhood you're going to fall into. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> this what ride goes, What do we shit. call that guy? He, uh, he ran for mayor and he went fucking ballistic. It was Bob Stupid's Vagrant World, we called it. Vegas World, it was called. 
beside the stratosphere. Oh, the world's largest souvenir store yeah, where Bob that little Stupak's, whole thing is? Yeah, yeah. Bob Stupak's yeah. Vegas World, and we called it Bob Stupid's Vagrant World, and yeah. that's where they finally absconded my fake ID, because <laughs> I kept going to that goddamn casino because it was close <clears throat> to Fun City, and I was lazy. Yeah. And they kept fucking throwing me out, yeah. but I kept going back. Yeah. Anyway, all right. I that guess is a, this that's is a, a scary. Podcast. That's I'm, a scarier town to walk around. It's a, everything. So no worse. gun walked around there being drunk. Nothing bad happened to you. I was a young kid with a mullet. I was adorable. Who would touch me? <laughs> Those people there that would touch you. <laughs> you dodged a bullet. <laughs> yeah. I I, I I fucked women that would be called cougars now, and now I would call young girls. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing how you age. Fucking right. Dick Hunter. Hopefully, forty-eight. You say? Actually, 40, I, May forty-seven. I, I, what's your uh, birthday? Uh, September eighteenth, nineteen seventy. Nine. Oh well, no, no. Here's the deal: is I'm actually throwing Richard Hunter into the database right now. Oh. I because I make the rules. Yeah, it's Bingo's a, in the database. Yeah. Okay, yeah. because of this appearance, thank you, thank you. Nine eighteen seventy eight. I'm yes, I'm ava- now officially available. Oh no, the year is nineteen seventy. Seventy. He I'm, looks uh, exactly like he did fifteen years ago when I met him. Hey, well, where were you, where he's were not you dying born? anytime Fort soon. Fort Worth, Texas. No, this my, fucking vegan is the worst fucking bet you could have. My philosophy: never had a drop of alcohol, never smoked, never done a drug. I didn't know that. About you didn't him. know that about him? No, he yeah, just this... showed up at the Dallas Improv with. No, I always make jokes about that because here the kid grew up around. Your grandfather owned a liquor store. Right. So he grew up in a liquor store, but never drank alcohol. You know, then gets into music when he's 16, travels with a band where everybody's 60. Yeah. Musicians are scumbags too, right? So you're sitting there going, okay, he doesn't do anything there. Then goes into a comedy career where he's doing stand up comedy, which. Uh, I'm pretty convinced they're kind of some of the most degenerate human beings you can fucking be around. <laughs> but still, and now he works at a fucking brothel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but He's around the worst human beings in the world. Stand-up comics are really the most intelligent people of any art form that That's why I they're know. the most miserable. Intelligence and misery go hand in hand. But when it comes to uh, uh, MMA... Well, not so intelligent. Boxing... When you would watch boxers that are your age or a little bit older, but I'm going to do a disservice to a hackneyed bit, but I remember Butch Lord talked about boxers back when boxing was a thing. And he goes, they shouldn't talk in interviews. I knew evidentially, Bob, I would become a container. Yeah. <laughs> Well, for me, I and mean, then I remember, uh, sorry, Ken Shamrock talking when I first started yeah, watching yeah. MMA, and he's like, "What I'm working on now is uh, not so much expending energy; it's the economy of motion." Like, <laughs> and he's like 42 at the time, where any boxer would be going, "Evidently, I will become a yeah. container." No, the brain damage between MMA. I mean, on a more uh, serious note it's because standing eight count in boxing, they get hit, dropped with a concussion. And if you can get back up in 10 seconds, they send you back out there after a guy's going to try to knock your head off again. In MMA, you get a concussion fights over with. And the more we learn about, you know, trauma, you see football players, Gronsky, you know, two weeks ago, you know, you get a concussion, you're out of the game. Football players, you know, of the past. And suffer- then 10 years later, yeah, they're fucking shooting, shooting, your say out, shooting, shooting yeah. yourself in the chest. That's because saying, they play study through. my brain. Yeah. This is not going to work No, out I think well. they did that thing where there was like a, they, 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 about 130 of the athletes that have donated their brains. Like 129 of them have the brain damage. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the 90 the CTE something percent. Yeah. CTE. Yeah. No, that's true. People yeah. see the you most. down with CTE? <laughs> yeah, I hope not. You know me. People see the uh, the 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 momentary totality of MMA, like in a knockout, and to them that's the most brutal thing they've seen. But what they don't realize, like Frank just said, is that's actually better than Frank getting. Frank doesn't remember saying it. He's <laughs> that's why I'm here to remind him. Uh, I take that, advantage of that shit. Yeah, that's actually better than getting punched in the head 300 times yeah, through yeah. the course of a fight and not getting knocked out, yeah. but staying just conscious no, enough. No, I actually took a to test that the they blow. get boxers. So there's a lot of things that. They don't have, 
but MMA because we're a fairly still new sport. We get a lot of the holdover stuff from boxing. Like, well, you got to pass this exam and pass that exam. Well, when I turned 35, I had to pass a neurological exam. They give boxers. And I remember I was kind of nervous about it. I'm like, well, fuck, I've been fighting at the time, you know, like 14 years. I'm like, shit, you know what I mean? Like, if something shows up, I'm going to lose my livelihood, you know? So I mean, that's a nervous situation. So I, my wife, the night before, I didn't sleep well. You know, I got up, you know, I ate a good meal. I'm sitting there, okay, I'm going to be focused on this. I go to the test and I'm sitting there, I'm amped up, ready to go. Like, all right, go. And they started talking about halfway through, Jen calls me. I'm like, babe, uh, it's cool. It's all right. I even told the guy, I'm like, if I couldn't pass this test, I'm like, are there people that can't pass? He goes, yeah. We have boxers in here all the time that can't pass this test. I'm like, if you can't pass this test, fuck fighting. You shouldn't be driving a car. You know what I mean? Like, you're a liability. You know what I mean? Like, at one point, they were like, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm like, all right, well, you know. Okay, it was pencil, paper, penny, table. I'm like, all right, cool. All right. And then, like, about 10 minutes later, like, hey, the four things I, I asked you about, like the pencil, paper, penny, table. He goes, yeah. I'm like, shut the fuck up. And then they handed me, like, a piece of paper. Can you fold it in half and make the edges match? I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. Are you these, serious? These really? are these are psyche valve questions. Yeah, there was I'm that's, sure that's that's the same thing they do in psyche valve. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm, like, I'm sitting there, I'm like just stunned. The whole time I'm like so in shock. I'm like, Is this a trick question? You, are you serious with people? I mean, then I took like a test on a computer. There was like a kindergarten game. Like, all right, here's a triangle and a circle. Which one now? Here's a square. Would it fit in either one of them? I'm like, dude, I feel like what was that movie? Idiocracy, you know, yeah. taking the exam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, shut the fuck up, man. Are you serious right now? I'm like, I walked out feeling like a million bucks. I'm like, all right, I got no brain damage that I know of because <laughs> maybe it just depends on how good at defense you are. Because I'm while I'm, while I'm talking to with Frank here, I'm looking and I know he has really great ears. There's not a lot of MMA no, fighters that have right. regular looking ears. So no, maybe it's, it's just. I'm you, looking you at the cauliflower one on this side. Yeah, oh, it's a, maybe it's he has a, a gorgeous right one on that side. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, also, but I, well, here's the thing too on that note is that anytime I get my ear busted and it fills up with blood, you have a window of a day or two where if you stick a needle in there, you, drain it out. you can drain it. Yeah. But a lot of guys don't when they're younger because it's like a badge of honor. It's right. like, oh, look, yeah. my ears yeah. are fucked up in the fighter. Yeah. yeah you Iowa wrestling. Yeah, yeah. My thought was, I'll show you I'm a badass. I don't need to necessarily look like a badass. Let me tell you yeah. something. There is a, there is a million dollar idea for the first plastic surgeon that, that starts offering free collagen injections to make artificial cauliflower ears. The Dude, wannabe tough I'm guys will start getting those like, like, like girls like get boob jobs. Yes. I know. I'm so surprised yeah. that's the actually first not a that, thing. That, the, the guy that will do it is the first guy that made tribal tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're exactly right. There are, those, there are guys out there that would do that. Because I see guys out there get a little bit of a knot, and I've had them in the gym, and I'll be like, oh, hey, man, you got a problem there? I, I could fix it. You know, What do you mean? I'm like, well, you know, look, fuck, it's 39 cents. Go buy a syringe down at the pharmacy, and I'll, drain, it I'll drain your ear for you. No, I'm okay. I'm like, you want your ear to look fucked up? Like, yeah, I'm all, all right. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, you know, hey, each to their own, you know. Joby and I saw the uh, one fight. It was a female fight yeah. where the, the her cauliflower ear exploded when it got oh, yeah. punched. Yeah. That was, uh, that was Wesley open. Smith yes. when that happened. It oh. actually split. Oh, that yeah. so Well, and that's the thing. It causes you to lose fights. They'll call it. Let's go in that direction because Joby and Chad. Uh-oh. I've only been to Chad's house. Chad scares me. <laughs> We do the podcast, but in reality, he scares me. So I yeah, has only went to his house sometimes. once to drop him off after right a so. scary trip we took together. But they will get together and watch chick fights Invicta. on. Invicta. Yeah, Invicta. Yeah, yeah. Like we're huge Invicta fans. Like, oh. oh, my God. Yeah, I don't know if they it. jack yeah. off on opposite corners of the room. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or they <laughs> jack each other off. Yeah, it's like the Bellagio. The, the, oh, like the, the water you know, show. I was a late yeah. comer to that, honestly. I grew up, my father's from Cuba, so I got raised in a very much like, the man has a, yeah. men aren't better than women in, our, in the belief system, but it's like, okay, this is the man's job. Just like if, you know, if a guy came to your yard and started screaming, it's the man's job to go out there and address him. Now, when it comes to, if you go into his house and it's messy, you blame the woman. Well, why isn't your house kept? You know, there was a, a certain order to things. And so, no, honestly, I was very late yeah. to the game of fighting amongst women. But now, I think it's a good idea. You know, like, oh, women can be empowered. I have a daughter who's going to be a professional fighter now. And, you know, like, now I'm all for it, which I think is kind of strange. 
Because it's like now I get to see these two worlds collide, right? Yeah. Because you have oh, these yeah. girls in MMA now that are, are empowered females that are fucking, you know. Badass. Right? Oh, and they oh, step in God. there. But yeah. then you still have the old school girl who walks on the outside of the cage with the ring card girl. Ah, who has no discernible skill whatsoever besides yeah. <laughs> her sex appeal that she wants to get fucked by everybody, right? Yeah. Professional hot chicks, what Joe Rogan called them one time. Yeah. I thought oh. it was hilarious. But no, when we were, one time. When we... Yeah. For when we were watching Invicta, one cousin. of the first times watching Invicta fight, that's what my wife was like, why is there not men walking around in Speedos? With yeah. I'm surprised you're not like, going to make a chance. Make, they did it yeah. in the, uh, the, the race car. Yeah, absolutely. Well, no, it's even to the point now to where like I was, before I was like, oh, that's, a, that's the woman's job to be the ring car girl. It's a man's job to walk in there and beat each other up. But now because of the things have changed and now, you know, I'm growing older and learning. Okay, well, no, that's not the way to think about things. But we still had that holdover. I, I remember just seeing something recently where I think Ariana Celeste, they put her as like the, the queen of the octagon. I'm like, yeah. bitch, you never even been inside the octagon. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you, the queen of the octagon? Like Amanda Nunez, fucking Misha Tate, Ronda Rousey. Yeah. Like, oh, those yeah. are the queens of the fucking octagon. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it they is, fight. You just sit outside and put on your makeup. Oh, yeah. it, is, it, is, yeah. it is funny to hear the ring card girl interviewed that has a real sense of self-importance. Because, uh, like, I remember hearing one of them interviewed the UFC bought a competing company, right? So they're going to absorb it into yeah. their company. Well, she had worked for the company that was getting purchased by the UFC. And she went, I, I heard an interview with her. She went on this long soliloquy about what the transition and the adjustment to her approach of carrying the <laughs> ring card was going to be like now that she was moving to the in UFC. The and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, in the old organization, you wore a blue bikini yeah. and in the UFC, you yeah. wear a red one. Well, so once you man. switch those out, they, I'm thinking man. the style will pretty much be the same. They use a completely different camera angle on her yeah. ass. It's yeah, a right. completely yeah. different And the thing scenario. is that all of yeah. us know that when that girl's talking, we're like, dude, you just, you're fucking hot. That's it. That's yeah. all. That's the only discernible skill that you're bringing <laughs> hot, to the yeah. skill. Yeah. You know, yeah. The set. You know, well, some of them have outside things like the girl Brittany Palmer. She's like a fucking really accomplished artist on the outside, right? Like she's a painter, know, right? Yeah. yeah, a painter. Like you can use it as a springboard, but if that's your only claim, I'm a ring card girl and I'm super hot, I'm like, yeah, in 10 years, you're yeah. fucked. You know what okay. I mean? Like you're not getting, you know what I mean? To close this out, because we listened to that uh, Bisping thing, it's like, hey, it's tough when you're a fighter. I don't blame anyone for going into stand-up comedy or anything else because it's tough to leave fighting and go into... Fucking... Uh, Al's not here anymore. But... uh, So what are you going to do next? Oh, well, you know what? Honestly, look, I'm 38 now, and there's fighters in the heavyweight division that are fighting 43, 44, and still very successful. So at least I'm blessed that I'm in a division because of just the way humans are. Uh, the bigger guys, we mature older, later. You know what I mean? 38, if I was a 125 pounder, I'd be ancient. Uh, as a heavyweight, I'm still actually in the middle of the pack, yeah, age right. wise. Yeah, yeah, but that being said, look, 45 is only, you know, six years away. I'm probably not fighting past that. So I, I do commentary now for the ACB. Uh, and then I, I, I like commentating, breaking down fights in, in the simplest. Bisping did say, you know what? Frank Muir is a fucking smart yeah. guy. He well, did on that. Yeah, yeah and the reason why I like is smart and in that I I take that too as a is a I don't go like, well, I'm a fighter, I'm here, I've won a couple world championships. So you're you know, my name recognition is what's gonna give me this job. I actually want to do a good job. Every time I commentate, Brian Lacey, who's actually a com a, a, a comic over in uh, in England, is my uh, co-host with that. I want to do a good job and I look for that compliment. Like I remember the first time I got a compliment that made me go like, oh. I really want to be good at this was a guy came up to me and goes, Hey man, I love everything you were saying. I, I learned a few things, but you know what? My mom finally sat down and watched one of the fights and she heard you breaking it down and explaining what was going on. She's a fan now. I was like, Oh, nice. that's fucking huge. That's a huge compliment that if I can break it down in simplistic, uh, in a simplistic form that a non combative person who never wrestled in high school Never took a karate class, doesn't know shit about jujitsu, thinks it's a cuisine in Japan or something, right? Could watch it and go, oh, so they're not just laying there like, well, why is he between his legs? Oh, that's the guard. Look, he's actually controlling his wrist. Oh, he's pushing, he's going for a triangle. He's going to choke. Oh, the other guy's posturing up. See, now he needs to drive forward. Oh, now he's driving, you know, and then explaining that 
has always been something. And then and then now the comedy thing, doing the podcast with Richard, doing this, talking. I thought you were going to say that you were going to go back to your roots at Bonanza High and uh, <laughs> throw a discus. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you did go old school. I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was fun, that. man, throwing I, discus. I was yeah. wondering if you would be willing to be a, a ring card man for Invicta. Yeah. Well. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever got. If it ever comes down to the kids, the lights are going to get turned off. I'll do what I got to do, man. You know, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, right? <laughs> Big Dick Hunter. Oh. Once, once you, because uh, uh, once I get done with comedy, I'm going to get into fighting. Yeah. <laughs> Our Legends League. Yeah. You're in Vegas now. Yep. Yep. Uh, d- doing the podcast with Frank. Uh, doing stand up, which is Vegas actually really kind of kickstarted that for me. I mean, I started doing some stand up when I was still in Dallas, but the nice thing about Vegas is, you know, it's like, like, I mean, there's a lot more gigs around, if you will. So, uh, there's that. And then my oddball job doing the, uh, public relations for the, uh, for the, the whorehouses. Well, and the you guys are both having fun. And that's yeah. All and it's not hard to get yeah. people to come visit us. I'm no, sure. no, no, exactly. Dudes. Yeah. Hey, that's true. No, right. You know what? You guys, yeah. Yeah. No, that, that is true. Cause totally not hard to sell, right? Like, Hey, yeah, come yeah. to Vegas yeah. to the yeah. podcast I, with us. My, right. listen, my, my goal has always been, I may not, end up in the nursing home with the most money, but I'm going to have the best stories in the day room. You know, like yeah. I, I want to be able to, I'm like, to me, I'm like, you know, the embedded journalist that's just collecting those stories. And even the weird ones that you don't expect, you know, the curveballs through the brothel and stuff like that end up being this great resource of uh material. You know, I mean, I probably are one of our most downloaded podcasts The I'll tell you this real quick. We, uh, they, they love the brothel stories. You know, they come for the MMA, but they, they love the brothel stories. So, so our most, some of our most downloaded podcasts are when we sit down and Frank's like, you know, how was work today? I'm like, I got a story for you. Jesus we, Christ, he has some stories. We had a dude, wait, we had a, wait, wait, wait. we're all nodding in agreement. Where we go? Yeah, we didn't think this was a big story, but that's our most downloaded podcast. Right. No, totally. And that's the way it happens. We had a dude come in. I'll, I'll give you this one more. We had a dude come in, uh, uh, I don't know, nine months ago, something like that. This is my told the story, story of the podcast. So the guy comes in. Frank's like, how was your dad? I go, well, we had a problem. And, and understand, all I'm really supposed to be doing there is writing press releases, coming up with the stunt, you know, uh, getting it out there and, and crafting the, the, the message, if you will. But being there embedded when duty calls, I do try to help out any way I can. And one particular random afternoon, just like with Lamar Odom, there's a disturbance at the cashier's window and I walk out there and there's a, a an Asian dude. And he is very upset uh, with the cashier. And I said, uh, what is wrong? And the cashier says, uh, he wants a full refund. Okay. This is after his interlude. And I said, well, sir, what is the problem? He proceeded to tell me that his customer complaint was that he had hired his prostitute to act dead while he fucked her and he could still see her breathing. And so it ruined the experience for him, and he wanted a full refund. Now, this was an hour after they entered the boudoir. So I said, well, here's the problem. So first of all, we don't offer refunds. But I said, you basically had your whole experience. This is like polishing off the entree and then saying you didn't enjoy the meal, right? And so uh, we do a little back and forth. And I said, all right, I tell you what. And I get Dennis on the phone, you know, get the OK. I said, I tell you what we're going to do. Just as a good faith gesture, we can give you a 50% refund, which we never do. So he accepted that. He leaves and goes to the Beatty Small Claims Court and files a complaint against the brothel for the other 50% of his money. He had to show up to court. About three weeks later, I have to go to Beatty Small Claims Court to defend the brothel's (laughs) good name against this uh, malcontent. So we go into the courtroom... And we're sitting there, you know, courtroom. There's the old lady uh, stenographer <laughs> tapping out her nose. There's the old judge with his 
bifocal readers on. Understand too, the only <laughs> other thing on the docket in this courtroom today, that day, is somebody trying to get a title to an abandoned boat. So this is the kind of, <laughs> this is the kind of business they're used to dealing with. Like the, you know, the Bisbee police blotter, right? Abandoned <laughs> boat and a breathing hooker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, our case comes up and this guy comes in the courtroom and he has made like exhibits of evidence. Like he's got big things blown up on poster boards and the exhibits are labels. Her name is Susan Blackford in this town, but go yeah. ahead. <laughs> he's introducing things into evidence. He's got his exhibits. He's using quotes from Dennis and the media. He's basically trying to, you know, infer that this whole thing is, is a scam. So then I have to get up and, uh, you know, present the defense. Uh, and I said, listen, um, uh, and I, I see the, the matronly uh, stenographer and I said, ma'am, ma apologies, I'm going to have to use some frank language. <laughs> and I said, uh, you see what Mr. Lee had uh, uh, requested is what we refer to as a necrophilia party. <laughs> and that is a, a premium price level. So what he knew exactly what he was getting into. He completed the experience and then wanted his money back. The judge, by the way, really liked my uh, consumed entree restaurant analogy, by the way. And uh, so I, 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 I laid all that out. He had also tried to subpoena her to testify, but he only had her fake candy sunshine name or whatever. <laughs> And she had hightailed it back to rural Tennessee by the time he was trying to serve his subpoena. So uh, his case was thrown out. Uh, they found in favor of us. And I got to tell you, it was like one of the greatest days of my life. Like, I didn't know I was going to get to have that experience. But I was like, you know, how do you put a price on getting to say that somehow this works its way into your job description? <laughs> it's uh, the life we've led just the story value alone where I don't remember half of them and I love running into people who go, you remember that? Oh, fuck, we did that. Oh, yeah. shit. What do you ladies so, think about this whole Patriot Act business? <laughs> see? Which was very topical material at the time, by the way. I mean, that I, was... I hated yeah. being there. Anyway, we're going to close this goddamn podcast... All right, I, I've got one uh, couple of things. Yes. For uh, phone booth fighting fans and death pool fans, mm -hmm. trade round is coming up. It is. For the first time of 2018, our first trade round is coming up. Mm -hmm. So get on it. Uh, Richard Hunter is in the database available now. for your trade consideration. Yeah. So, big uh, Dick Hunter. Big Dick Hunter. Don't ever is let him live database. it down. And uh, we've got. Uh, what do you think of the new T-shirts? We got. I love these. Yeah, yeah. thank you for uh, yeah. gifting uh, we got me new this. Deathpool T-shirts mm -hmm. coming out. Uh, they'll be on the website soon. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, oh, you went with black. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Skull uh, shocker. Frank Mir, how much a uh, 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 focus do you put in showing how big your dick is in your trunks when you fight? Because a lot of people, when they're UFCing, just. Like I do, I have to see how big your dick is. The, no, that's it, you, Stanhope. Yeah, yeah. That's no, not a lot that's of people bullshit, you. ladies. Yeah. Come on, uh, a they wear a cup times. for fuck's sake. Yeah. You're yeah. looking at a cup. Yeah, they don't look like they have a cup. Well, it's a that's cup. to attract <laughs> your audience of you. <laughs> Tell them All the right. one about when you. All right, I'm the only guy. Beat it. Go ahead, fucking finish up. But a lot of the guys look like they fucking sh sh try to show off their dick. That's a pair of socks, you fuck. <laughs> tell them the tell them the one about a when pair? your uh, when your cup moved. Was that the the uh, was that the crow cop fight when it shifted and yeah. one ball was out and one ball was in? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was fighting a guy named Miracle Crow Cop. He threw a knee, uh, he hit me inadvertently in the groin, and he you know guy hits hard, oh, yeah. uh, kicks hard, and so a knee from him shifted my cup quite a little bit over and uh, not all of me stayed inside the cup <laughs> oh, and my so cup i tried to cinch it real tight to me so now he's moved it over and some of me's falling out so i'm trying to reshift the cup and now i'm getting the point to where i mean if you go back and watch it you see me actually like lay on the ground trying to move in every direction because i have my hands are wrapped and have gloves on they don't necessarily make for the most dexterous 
<laughs> ability to move. So I'm trying to, without just being completely obscene on camera, because there's no angle I can go yeah. where there's not going to be a camera on me, <laughs> basically pulling my junk out, trying to shove it back into the cup. You know what I mean? So yeah, that was a moment where then I'm looking in the corners, looking at me. I'm just like, how do I tell you right now? Like, is, there's mics everywhere too. Like, my balls are on the outside of the cup. Like, the beans and the Frank aren't in the same spot, man. <laughs> there should definitely be an MMA safe word for my balls are out. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that you would actually go back and watch. Would you more rather watch your first four appearances doing stand up comedy versus watching you fight with your balls hanging out? <laughs> like, I can't watch myself doing anything. No, I don't watch any of my old stuff. Well, you did watch you. No, no, I, I'm aware of it because people pointed it out. No, because someone else pointed it out to me afterwards. So, uh, I've seen a couple of my fights in, in glimpses, but no, I don't know. Hard to watch? Yeah, I have a hard time seeing myself on TV. In fact, we yeah, have, yeah, I'm yeah. on a video game with the UFC and stuff, and uh, that's the quickest way to clear me out of a room. If yeah, you, yeah. if you put the game on, first of all, the music kind of gets me fucked up a little bit. You know, yeah. it's like, Pavla's, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and, and then if you pick me as a character, I've had people do that before thinking that's going to, oh, look, yeah, I'm picking you. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm out of here. Well, that when sucks. we came in, uh, when you finally, finally showed up, by the way, I am shit faced because you guys were three fucking hours late. Yeah. We yeah. start drinking what at a certain like? time for a podcast. We were too, but we but for sure, I knew out. we were in trouble right. when I texted Joby and I said, "Hey, you know that we didn't account for the time change, right?" And he, we he said, didn't account for the time. I think it was you. No, I don't mean you. I mean <laughs> me and Frank. But 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 Joby said four thirty. Yeah, at seven o'clock. Yeah, Gumps are making hamburgers and they're not here yet. No, and and uh, Joby said we'll be drunk by then. That was his his heads up to me. Yeah. Yeah, and better show. You're gonna eat Great. first. Yeah. So, someone found UFC happened to be on TV on Fox Sports One. So they have Fox Sports on the TV. Frank shows up, and I said the worst thing if I traveled several hours to the fucking middle of nowhere to do a podcast of a guy I don't know, and they have. Stand up comedy on, I'd go, Oh, geez, I don't want to stand up comedy, but Frank, he was fucking oh, into it. He was doing and commentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know for all of us to I'm okay. hear. I well, was trying to I lean love in fighting. and listen. The fact that there was other people on there, I'm okay. If I'd have walked in, you guys yeah. were playing my fights. I, uh, that I, yeah, I'd love, to, I, like, yeah. I'd love yeah, to watch so. Invicta with you. Yeah. Like, I love doing so this. We stuff. have such a good time with Invicta. It's just such a blast. Well, when you guys come up, because yeah. you now you owe us the swap yeah, cast yeah, on yeah, our yeah. home field. We were going to do that first. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. we'll do that next. Maybe we'll also sit down okay. and watch a fight, too. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. We yeah. do a little well, fight we'll do companion, only fight companion. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. yeah Absolutely. Yep. Sounds right. good. We were we were going to do it. You you guys balked. No, the, no, dude. no. Came here. It's we're going there next. Because we're all retarded. Yeah, but the door, the gambling addicts, the seal has been broken. The door is open. And as I, I actually said this to Doug off the air, I now know what it feels like when, you know, sticks calls up Night Ranger and says, let's get together. And by the way, get Ted Nugent over here. And uh, let's, is, first of is all, Ario Speedwagon parts available? Of sticks were in Night Ranger. Uh, Tommy Shaw was in Night Ranger. So it's really, you. Who was in Night Ranger? Uh, yeah. No. When? Tommy Shaw was in Night Ranger. No. No, I don't know who the fuck Night Frank, Rangers are. Frank, <laughs> Frank and I, Frank and I both look like the dude from Revenge of the Nerds who goes nerd. <laughs> hey, 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 hey! You can't say I that know word. Only we music, can say that word. But I swear, Tommy Shaw is a Night Ranger. All right, we'll settle that off the air. No, I don't no, know about that. No, but yeah. Everyone will settle it for us on Twitter. Yes, at right. Frank Mirror. Yeah, M I R. At the Frank Mirror yeah. on Twitter. The, the Frank yeah, Mirror. Frank Mirror. Yours yeah. at Richard Hunter. And we also have at uh, phone, or phone booth fight, phone, phone booth, booth fighting, fighting. Yeah. Booth at fighting. HD at Fatty HD for Fatty. Chad Shank, Harley Davidson Fatty, HD and, and Stan at, Hope CDP, Doug Stan Hope Celebrity Death Bowl. You should have your own fucking thing. You, Why? Mm. Well, because it confuses people. They think no, no. Me. Yeah, but he hates what he has to do already with it. Yeah, right. it's, I hate that's, it that's. The, uh, that's all I need to We've do is death, death pool. Death, yeah. Have you ever uh, uh, 
won money on someone dying. Thing? I got close. <laughs> yeah, you got yeah. close. No, yeah. That you knew? No, so far no one that no. Well, I wish I would have. Well, I remember when we went and visited Ralphie May. Oh, oh, okay, right, 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 Ralphie I remember, May. I watched him walk in, and I'm like looking at him, and, I, and I'm a fan. You know, loved his comments. It's about, like, it's about two months motherfucker. before. Yeah. yeah, and I'm like looking at him, like I even told Richard, I'm like, hey man, he doesn't look right. His yeah. lips are yeah. blue, like he doesn't. You know, what I mean, mm-hmm. and he was talking highly intelligent guy, and was sitting there going. Wow, that guy's. That's, that was yeah. the first time Frank had ever met him. I mean, you know, I've known Ralphie for years, and I told Frank, I said, you know, even for Ralphie, that's the worst that I've. Yeah. Ever, I mean, it, it did not look good. But at about the same time, I had explained to him, Doug puts him on Death Pool every year. Uh, Ralphie knows he's on there. When I, mean, I took him out one year when we got really yep. competitive, he goes, "You can't take me out, buddy." I'm always in your death pool. Yeah. Right. Put me right. back in, coach. It was a gentleman's agreement. He knew he was in there, yeah. but yeah, I know. And he basically, you know what? That was like his last gift. I mean, he yeah. won that thing for you. Finally paid off. Yeah. 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 Absolutely I've never won any money on it, but when, when Ron Jeremy had his heart attack, that was weird because oh, I had him on my team. War yeah. machine. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking you got close war to that machine. One. Fuck no. no. That's God the problem. That's the a, fucking no, problem. Richard had him on his list. He tried to commit suicide, was going to die. Yeah, when he was in jail and prison. And someone brought him back. The and prison, someone brought him back. You prison guard. Him money. If, if, I ever, if I ever meet the prison guard what? that cut him down. Yeah, yeah, when he got convicted, now he's going to do like 35 years. Yeah. War Machine is not my hero. <laughs> I just said I understood the situation. Yeah. <laughs> Deadpool changes your perspective on Tomorrow a lot of stuff. I have to take these Faggots down to uh, the Cafe Roca for dinner. Yeah. I have to sleep. Yeah. I have a... Hang on. Let me shake it. Seroquel. I'm going to have to do a long 12-hour Seroquel sleep, but tomorrow night we're going to Cafe Roca. Nice. Yeah. For dinner. That's Bisbee's finest, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. great. They can still wear pajamas. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It, it, it's expected. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have a pair of pajama pants on, they give you a pair. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Bisbee's cool. good like that. Yeah. No. But uh, yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you oh, for hosting awesome. us. This has been yeah. fantastic. We look Frank forward to Beer. having you in Vegas. Big Dick Hunter. Yes. Do you, do you prefer Richard Hunter now? No, here's now that the thing. You're a man of a certain age. <laughs> New friends call me Richard, but my old friends like you call me Big Dick. They still do. I, I'm, Big go, Dick I'm going with Richard because yeah. uh, I'm a, a bit older. Chad Shank, Joby stepping in for Chaley for a while. And, uh, right. and the wives and the other people that are no wandered back, out. Yeah. The ladies' auxiliary. Shut the fuck up. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. You can hate me now. Kill me. But I won't stop now. Real niggas. Because I can't stop now. Come on. But I won't stop now. Because I can't stop now. You can hate me now. I hate you too. But I won't stop now. Come on. You hate me now. Because I can't stop now. You can hate me now. You hate me now.